Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm going to call this meeting to order. So the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. And there was one pretty small change that I wanted to make, which was reversing the order of um, the Old Country Club Road plan and the plan for or discussing the plan for the Moat property. So we're going to uh, do the discussion about the the Moat uh, property before the Old Country Club Road. So just switching those uh, sort of last two items. Um, any other uh, additions, questions, objections? Okay, so uh, without objection, we had to consider the agenda approved. And so on to general business and appearances. So this is a time for any member of the public to come address the council on any topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. And if you would try to keep your comments to about two minutes, that'd be great. Hi. Um, My name's Sandy Vitztoom, 14 Loomis Street. And um, I just submitted a letter. Um, I've lived in Montpelier for nearly 50 years and I've watched four generations participate in civic discourse. Many large issues have faced the city over the years. Money's always been scarce with 8,000 residents, a few commercial properties, very little industry, and a beautiful state capital. What makes this precious tiny city work is the understanding that we are all in this together and that we all care, and that each one of us matters. Um, I've noticed a decline in civic discourse, however. I remember careful and exclusive, uh, inclusive deliberation and focus on facts. Conflicts used to seem to develop over misunderstanding rather than party lines or special interests, and they were usually solved by education. Um, many, many of the sessions I've watched over the years and participated in, that really did solve it. That and taking time. Historically, Montpelier citizens reach consensus. Somehow the proposed parking garage has become a divisive issue, and it's being framed as a support or lack of support of our merchants. I have attended several city meetings about the proposed parking garage, and I did sign a petition, petition a couple weeks ago. I totally support our merchants, and um, the re my questions are about safety, legality, and costs. It was kind of shocking last week to read about an interview with Bill in the bridge. And I want to say, first of all, I love Bill. I love his family and his kids. He's played music on my porch many years. I have complete admiration for Bill, so <laughs> I don't want my comments to become divisive in any way. Um, but Bill was, I think, representing the city when he was quoted in the bridge is saying, while the petitioners are entitled to challenge the product, project, he believes the reasons might be more philosophical than procedural. And he said, sorry, Bill, my sense is that they just don't like the project and that they're seeking to impose their will on the will of the voters. That's a pretty serious accusation. I'd like to say publicly that this kind of language is divisive and it's misleading to the readers. Um, Bill did not qualify the statement by saying that they were his personal opinion. I can't speak for the other people who signed the petition, but he's dead wrong about my concerns and my motivation. I can't think of any sit kind of setting where this comment would actually be constructive. I'm looking to the city council and the city's representatives to be models for civic discourse and to further our common good. I'm therefore asking the city to print an apology in the bridge to at least clarify that those opinions were of an individual, not of the city. Please, let's move forward on the garage and other civic improvements with cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. And uh, I just want to say th thank you for those sentiments, and um, certainly love to follow up on that. So we'll, we'll talk about it. Would you like to? I can. Yeah. I'm sorry if you took them that way. Um, <laughs> I had a very long conversation with the bridge. And first of all, I'm, I'm sorry we didn't get to just talk about this in private. Um, and they choose to use what they choose to use in, in the context that they choose to use it. And I believe I was actually asked the question, do you think people are doing this? And I said, they may be. Um, but maybe I didn't. But I. Uh, but we can also clarify. Yeah. yeah. So. But great. Thank you, Bill, for 
Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Uh, any further um, uh, comments from the public? Okay. Moving on then. Uh, so we have the consent agenda. Um, I have a, a question about item C, so I may just, uh, uh, we can either pull it or you can come address it right now. I just wanted to know a little bit more about it. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> just in the, in the spirit of progress here. Um, so th in 2012, the city had signed a pledge security agreement with Merchants Bank. Merchants Bank was... <laughs> Merchants Bank was uh, subsequently uh, purchased by Community Bank, uh, headquartered out of New York. Um, because our balances frequently exceed the um, deposit limits in, for insurance with FDIC, we need some sort of collateral to secure the money that we're keeping with them. Uh, presently, under a pledge security agreement, each month they have to take securities, whether it be bonds, stocks, or otherwise that they own, and actually identify those individual securities and place them in joint custody with the Federal Reserve Bank. For, from their perspective, that's extremely labor intensive each month to be doing that because our balances are changing <coughs> throughout the year. So what they've requested is that um, we get a uh, line of credit or letter of credit issued from the Federal Home Loan <coughs> Bank, which would guarantee our deposits up to whatever cap we decide um, it'd be like a surety bond or a guarantee so that in the event um, the bank were to fail, we wouldn't be out any of our deposits in excess of the FDIC limits. And we would just have to present that letter of credit to Federal Home Loan Bank and they would cut us a check for the funds. So it's essentially going from collateralizing using specific securities that they have to pledge mm -hmm. to essentially having an insurance policy that we can cash in mm -hmm. with, the, with the Federal Home Loan Bank. Have we had to do this before? We've always had some form of security okay. uh, agreement. And in the years past, we have had a letter of credit from mm -hmm. Federal Home Loan Bank. Okay. The pledge security agreement was something that came up uh, in 2012. Uh, it was just at the time, it was the preferred method of collateralizing large deposit accounts. Okay, great, thank you. That makes sense. Yep, that's, that's helpful. I would just point out, and I realize that maybe this is not that important, but the letter says gentlemen, which <laughs> I did not I realize that it comes from a bank, mm -hmm. but. It is a, yes, I noticed that as well, and that was a sample <laughs> format, so um, we will. Well, that's pretty offensive. We will, <laughs> <laughs> we will uh, be providing an updated one, and I will pass that commentary along because that is, uh, it is a little bit 1960s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. I just wanted to know, is this a standard approach for other Absolutely. municipals? Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, any one of the, any, any essentially yeah. any, any customer that has large balances uh, that are in excess of normal FDIC limits, you need some sort of collateralization agreement because otherwise, if a bank were to fail, like in the 1990s, mm -hmm. when we had yep. the savings and loans, you could be out significant amounts yeah. of money, which yeah. would mm -hmm. be detrimental, so. so yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. So uh, is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Move it. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Uh, so conservation commission appointments. Um, so we have, I believe, two uh, applicants for one seat. Am I, I, I think that's correct, right? So, um, and I don't see either Michael or Katie here. So um, we probably need to go into executive session. Uh, would anyone like to make that motion? <laughs> so moved. I move that we go into executive session pursuant to one VSA section 316, I think it is. That was off 13. the 313. Oh. It's okay. Um, to discuss the appointment of a uh, city committee member. Second. So I have a question, yeah. just a suggestion. If neither of them are here, yep. Do you want to take up other items that people are here for and do that? I don't think this is going to take that long. Okay. I think we should just keep moving. <laughs> okay. Uh, we didn't actually vote yet. Um, there was a second. Was there a second? There was a second. Okay. For the discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. We'll be right back. Okay. 
Do we have a motion to come out of executive session? So, so moved. Oh. <laughs> uh, second. Okay, great. This has been moved and seconded. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Uh, okay, do we have a motion? I'd like to choice. move to appoint Katie Michelle's to the Conservation Commission. I'll second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. That it's oh, for the, so. um, not for the, all for it's a oh, for uh, voting member. I don't know. For the, for the voting member. <laughs> okay, great, super. And there was a second. Mm -hmm. And further discussion? Yes. So does this mean that we, this now creates a vacancy in an alternate position that we'll have, to, we'll be warning for a future meeting? I think that is what that means. Great. Okay, further discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, and um, and uh, regardless of that neither of them are here, I'm just very grateful for both of their service on this committee uh, as they're both, uh, or were um, serving as alternates. Okay. Uh, so the Montpelier Foundation, so they have a request of us, so come on up and uh, tell us about it. Hey, good evening. Uh, I'm Ed Flanagan. This is Paul oh, Giuliani. Uh, I am the chair of the Montpelier Foundation, have been for the past uh, couple of years. And Paul I'm the uh, longest serving <laughs> trustee, 24 years, I believe. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Founding member, right? Founding member. Founding member. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, you were provided with some information about the, a little bit of the history, uh, uh, a little of the uh, uh, the plans on us moving forward. Uh, uh, I think there's some a real excitement on the board now. There's been some new members that have come on the board, and uh, uh, some great opportunities. Uh, to be able to do things in the uh, in the city of Montpelier, I mean, it was originally designed to uh, to do projects that may not uh, that may not happen otherwise. I mean, it, sort of one of the projects that was looked at years ago was you look at Kellogg Hubbard Library, and that probably wouldn't happen today under the the way things are sort of set up. But there were these groups, these foundations, or individuals that would provide this money to be able to make those types of things happen. And so that was sort of the initial impetus of having this foundation, of being able to do projects that uh, uh, that may not be able to get done. Otherwise, it would also be a uh, a source to maybe get it up over the top. They were close to getting everything together, but they needed that, that extra money to get it over the top. And in the packet that was provided for you is a pamphlet that we uh, put together that talks about some of the things that we had uh, uh, we had done. Uh, whether it was the uh, tennis courts out by the high school, that was a group in Montpelier that wanted to redo those uh, tennis courts. The surfaces of them were just abysmal. Uh, you really couldn't play on them and uh, on the courts. And so this was a uh, by using the uh, the foundation monies could be uh, gathered and used towards getting that done. Uh, same with uh, money was donated to the bike path uh, uh, and other projects throughout the the, the city of Montpelier. Uh, things have changed a little bit, and there's other opportunities there that because of the setup of what we are today. Uh, it's not possible to be able to get uh, uh, certain monies because they want to donate to a nonprofit, a 501c3 nonprofit. And we're not that because of the, we're under the auspices of the city. And we feel there's a lot of opportunities out there to be able to do that, but our hands are sort of tied, uh, which sort of stymies opportunities to be able to do projects in Montpelier that uh, are for the community good. Uh, and so sort of that's the, uh, the reason for coming before you and saying it makes a lot of sense now to, uh, uh, to take this organization and break it off and let it uh, uh, become its own standalone 501c3 so that it can raise more funds to help projects in the city of Montpelier. I'll defer to Paul for the things I missed. No, he did a good job. He, uh, <coughs> I think it's worth mentioning that over the years the foundation uh, receives, has received donations and bequests, gifts, uh, some uh, memorials, uh, some are just outright gifts. The foundation last year received a very generous gift from uh, former councilman uh, Alan Weiss uh, with instructions for the foundation to use it as it sees best in the, in the city of Montpelier. Um, 
and to pick up on something uh, Ed said uh, about the, the the types of projects. You know, the, you obviously like to do things that are visible that people can use. Uh, as originally uh, established, the foundation's goal was to fund or help fund capital projects that had a, a long useful life uh, for, for the benefit of the community. And that uh, concept is enshrined in the proposed articles of association for the new entity. Uh, it's not designed and never was intended to, to, to subsidize any uh, particular city operation or, or, or function. It's, its goal, the foundation's goal, is to create visible capital community uh, type projects and we're convinced that uh, with a 501c3 exemption from the Treasury Department we're going to be able to access uh, funding sources that just weren't available to us as an agency of the city uh, even though gifts to the foundation under the Internal Revenue Code are exempt are, are deductible because the foundation is a, is a city agency most virtually all corporations and foundations and granting entities insist that the recipient be a 501c3 so we're kind of forced into that uh, uh, that situation and uh, uh, we're here tonight to request the city council's approval of just shifting from the present uh, format the present uh, entity to something brand new that we're convinced is going to uh, lead to a, a, a new one and broader source of funding. Questions? Yeah. Um, Rosie so and Donna. I had one question. I read through this fairly quickly, but I, I saw that the membership was elected and that the council appointed one member. Um, and I saw that the membership or the, the members elected their officers, but I couldn't tell who was doing the electing of the actual members of the board. It's intended to be a self-perpetuating board, open to anyone uh, who expresses an interest in sitting on the board, uh, and you know, has the Montpelier connection. Um, we wanted to keep this as streamlined and simple as possible, and you know, holding elections, uh, that just adds a, I don't say a distraction, but it's a dimension uh, I think we'd rather concentrate on, on the business of the foundation. But that board, in turn, does elect the offices of the foundation. We, we try to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, anyone who's interested in serving on the, as a trustee of the foundation, more than welcome. I guess that makes me a little uncomfortable. Just, I would prefer to have it, if it's going to be that loose, to have the council be appointing the full membership. Um, or have different entities appointing members. Um, I, I just, I don't really understand how a board can appoint itself. It's quite common in foundations. Okay. It's, it's self-perpetuating, self, I don't know what I'm looking for. It's, it's, it's self-perpetuating, where the only qualification for membership is that it be a natural person who has, you know, the Montpelier connection, Montpelier affinity. And uh, uh, I'm trying to think of another example, but it's it's not that uncommon. The TW Wood Board operates that way, mm -hmm. just as an example. Yeah. Yeah. Would there be a concern if it was still uh, appointed by the council, the members? I don't know. I can't. Well, yeah, I I mean I think, t and I can't. I'm not an attorney, and yeah, I, I'm I, not a tax attorney, but you know. Uh, but I think as a, to be a standalone, you've got to have that. I don't think you can have someone else saying, oh, well, you're, uh, you know. I, I but don't I, think but the but nonprofit bylaws will allow it. Allow for that. Yeah, because the, then we get back by the circular route of being an agency of the city, and we essentially shoot ourselves in the foot right. as far as the 501c3 is concerned. Um, the, we, we recognize the, the city council's concern uh, and, and interest in what the foundation does. That's why we provided in the articles and in the bylaws an ex officio member of the council uh, to, to sit as a trustee and report back to the council on what the foundation is doing. Um, 
and obviously we have to, the foundation will have to make annual reports, uh, annual filings with the IRS. So as far as activities are concerned, it's an open book. It's totally transparent. It has to be so we get the exemption. Okay. Moving on. Go ahead, Donna. Well, I, <clears throat> that wasn't originally one of my questions, but to follow up on Rosie's point of membership, there is something you could add to your bylaws about diversity. And likewise, there is one statement about gender, but I think it has to be broader than he or she these days. So I, I think that some of that needs to be honed in a little bit more, some editing there. My concern was that if indeed you became a nonprofit, then would you not be competing with, I was just looking to remind myself of the projects, whether it's the footbridge or the tennis courts, uh, the wood gallery, they're going after their own grants. Mm -hmm. And are you going to be going after the same grants? And are you going to be a silo or are you going to be coordinating with those entities which also are looking for the service to the same population? It really depends on what the project is. It mentioned um, the foundation traditionally and historically has been used, we'll call it one of a better phrase, the last mile. Um, a project, excuse me, has already gone through fundraising through other sources and needs $5,000 to finish the tennis court or something like that. That's where the foundation, <coughs> excuse me, has, um, has acted historically. So I don't see competition here. Um, the, it hasn't occurred so far and, uh, uh and it's really, the projects are to benefit the city of Montpelier. So it's like, you know, it, we're not in competition to say, oh, it's our dollars, their dollars. It's like, okay, let's get these projects done, uh, whatever they happen Well, as long as you're working as a team and coordinating the efforts, I think that's well, true. Yeah. Well, but if, if you that. don't, I know you had in the past, but you haven't been a nonprofit going out for grants on your own. Well, um, by virtue so. of, of the nonprofit's charter, we have to continue doing that. The foundation can't branch off into some other activity. It, it, uh, whatever resources it has, whatever money it spends, has to be spent for the benefit of the community. And it, it's, you know, there's another organization, another group uh, focused on the same project. We would welcome that. <coughs> uh, I, I don't see competition at all. No. It, it, it hasn't happened so far. In the 25 years it hasn't happened. No. It's always, I mean, and I don't think it's because it's been a, a uh, you know, uh, uh, under the city has had anything really to, to yeah. do with that. Uh, it's just that we were, the projects, people would come to us with projects saying we need to, you know, to get this done. And so... Yeah, well, the difference I see is that you've, co you, you've collected money and rather passively you've collected money. And that was one of the things of mm -hmm. enlivening the foundation and generating interest was to solicit more mm -hmm. money. Yes. But you really have been a collector. And then you've seen projects and you have been the last mile. Mm -hmm. But I see the role change over here as a more nonprofit seeking grants in a different mode. That's I see them okay. a little bit yeah. different roles. That's yeah. all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But for, to, uh, to be able to access funds from any business now, you need to be a, uh, uh, a you know, so you're sort of stuck in that uh, uh, the in between stage where businesses say, hey, if you're not that, we're not going to. Uh, uh, we're not going to be able to uh, uh, support you. Yeah, we, we've lost uh, support by virtue of being a city agency yeah, I as opposed that. to a 501 yeah. three. Um, Glenn and then Ashley. So I, I think I'm going to kind of pile on on the same kind of narrative, but um, a hypothetical. Um, if in the future, uh, I am not on city council and I end up on the board of the foundation and it also happens that a bunch of people on my street are on the board of the foundation and we say we think it's going to be a municipal good to have a nice new park on Prospect Street. <laughs> then the board of the foundation is the deciding, uh, you know, body in that case where currently as a city agency it eventually comes down to the city council elected by the, the population at, at large. Um, 
which is not to say that the, 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 the new independent nonprofit foundation would not be acting in the municipal good, but it's just a question of who is deciding what the municipal good is. Do you see where I'm going? Things, and so tell me whether I'm just completely off. Yeah, That's fine. That, yeah. That couldn't occur because the city owns the park. I mean, you could control whatever happens there. Yeah. The other thing to keep in mind is the foundation as today and going forward is strictly a funding agency. We're not involved in, in, in designing or permitting or constructing anything. It's we're we're the recipient of requests. We don't mm -hmm. go out looking for things to do. Yep. And, so I, I think it'd be, I, I, I just can't see the foundation going rogue and doing something, uh, uh, you know, spinning away from the city and taking on a role that it, it simply doesn't have the legal authority to do. Yeah, I guess, and, and I believe that. Like, I, I think that, that it's, it doesn't seem at all likely that anything like that would happen. And I think that you're, it seems, to me that you're probably completely right, that you, there is more, there are more funds to access as uh, an independent nonprofit. It's just a question for me of, currently, there is uh, a certain control of the whole city over this foundation. And uh, being an independent nonprofit means being an independent nonprofit. And, and I want to know exactly, you know, well, how that change plays out. Historically, I say that some members of the foundation board feel like orphans because the, the, the city council really hasn't spent a lot of time or had a lot of interest in what the foundation has been doing over the years. I remember coming to the council, I don't know, four or five years ago, and people didn't even know what I was talking about. So you know, if, if, if the, the board was going to become deranged and do something like that, they probably could have done it before. Again, again I, I mean, and... and T to be clear, I don't think, I, I, I see s almost no possibility that the board would become deranged. It's just a question of, <laughs> of, of I exactly whose yeah, priorities, okay. <laughs> <laughs> who, who's, who's, whose priorities are the deciding priorities, that's all. Yeah. And, and whether it is the city as embodied by the city council or the independent foundation, that's all. Uh, Ashley and then Jack. Um, so I, I am going to echo a similar sentiment, although to to sort of directly address Glenn's, Glenn's point, I mean, I'm looking right now at Article 3, which is the purpose and describes what the foundation is there to do. Um, and, and if this were to be a 501c3, you would have the authority to buy land and make a park. You know, you, you could buy things, you could buy property, you could buy objects, you could buy things, and and those <laughs> things m might not be things that the city council would, would want to do. Not saying that that would be the case right now, but we have no idea what the board would look like in three years, five years, ten years, whatever. Um, and so for me, it, it, it's... I would rather that we keep it as a city agency. Um, I'm also curious, uh, I know that there was a huge piece, I, I want to say it was set seven days maybe over the summer about nonprofits in Vermont and I'm just curious uh, if the plan would be uh, if the council were to approve this to become a 501c3 if you envisioned hiring an executive director and what that would look like because grant writing and, and all of those things take a huge amount of time I've written them for work before um, and it just strikes me that um, you know one will we have a staff two um, I guess I'm also very concerned about some of the corporate funding sources. Uh, you know, I, I think as a as a city, Montpelier uh, tries to be very cognizant of um, where things come from and what they mean, and uh, and and I am not comfortable sort of bowing to these um, to large corporations who have money and want particular things to happen. And I appreciate that that's not always the case, but I've lived in many other places where those things have happened, and it hasn't turned out to be the the sort of public private partnership that we uh, had envisioned, um, and, and I'm, I'm incredibly uncomfortable sort of uh, seeding that kind of 
control over uh, an organization that does so much good for our city um, and in essence sort of uh, creating an entity that can operate into perpetuity even if the city council uh, does not agree with a particular project or idea or um, you know an organization wants to donate so I, I'm wondering if you could respond to those points I don't believe we We've given any thought whatsoever to a staff or an executive director. It's purely volunteers. Uh, I don't envision, certainly in the short term, that changing at all. And your other concern is that it's, it's a very uh, diversified board today. And I think if there's any concern about the, you know, the, the pedigree of a potential donor, I'm sure it would come up at a board meeting and be discussed thoroughly. Uh, the, the mission here is not just to raise money at any cost. And we're going to be very sensitive to the source of any funding that's going to go into an asset that's going to be used by the community and hopefully benefit the community. So I mean, I, I would hope the council will have enough uh, trust in this board to, in one of a better phrase, to do the right thing. There's no, uh, uh, there'd be no percentages, no future for, for the foundation if, if it didn't adhere to, to some kind of a, uh, an ethical standard as far as from whom are we seeking uh, grants, requests, and donations. I guess it's just a question of trust. I don't know how else to respond. Certainly, and I, and I in no way uh, that was that was not an intent. My my intent there was not to sort of discredit or disregard anyone on the board right now. But going forward, the council wouldn't have any say in that other than an ex officio member who can't vote on anything, and and simply that would be a, a passive role for the city to play, um, which they would have no. I think they would have a voting. I don't think they said they were a non-voting member. I, I don't believe in it. To ex officio Absolutely. usually means not voting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's at least that's how I read well, I that. I thought ex officios could vote. No. Certain things. No. Okay. Um. Well, and so. Okay. Well, so I, let me. Right, that wasn't the intent. Okay. <laughs> Maybe poor choice of words, but that wasn't the intent. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the council rep to vote. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I, and again, I to me, you know, I appreciate the work that clearly went into this, but but for me, it doesn't make sense. I think there are lots of nonprofits that already exist here in Montpelier, and I think as a city, we can partner with them, which I know the foundation has done over the years and has assisted these other these other projects in meaningful ways, in incredibly meaningful ways. Um, but but to me, it's something that should remain in in this under the auspices of the city. Uh, Jack. To help me understand how much we should worry, be worrying about a uh, rogue board running amok with this, uh, how much money are we talking about here? How much does the foundation have the foundation in its control has about now? $120,000 that's invested in Maple Capital. Uh, uh, and, they, uh, and we use the proceeds <coughs> of the income from that money uh, primarily to be able to fund these projects. That's what the goal is. Uh, yeah, and the and purpose is, is to, to get the, this income out. We're not. You know, if we can grow that number, then we can. Uh, the income would increase, and there'd be more more money available for other projects. So you haven't be, been invading the corpus, but you use what you've been doing is just paying, making these grants out of the in, uh, income of the uh, of the fund. So I'm going to jump in here, and then, and Connor, you want to go? Cool. Um, so I am so grateful for all the um, work that you all have done in recent years. It seems like it's uh, really been coming alive lately, which is awesome. Um, and just so so you know where I, I stand on this, I, I, I'm i very happy to, um, you know, endorse this idea that, you know, you all become an independent 501c3. I mean, for me, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a math question, right? If there are other pots of money that exist, um, uh, and uh, it seems to me that the Montpelier Foundation is relatively unique as to what they do, then that is going to be bringing in more resources to the city, and uh, that's that's something that you know we stand to benefit more from if you all are uh, a 501c3. So uh, 
that I, I mean, I, I trust that you all would make great choices. <laughs> so um, anyway, that's that's uh, my my hope. <laughs> that, uh, but uh, we'll we'll see. So Connor, what's up? No, just piggybacking off Jack there. Um, not on average, like how much money is coming in a year, how much money is going out a year, um, and I know it fluctuates probably quite a bit. It fluctuates, it's a huge yeah. fluctuation. I mean, we had that we had money from uh, thirty-five thousand dollars from Alan Weiss, as the state was mm -hmm. that Alan had uh, put aside for the, the foundation. That was a lot of money for you know for a foundation that uh, uh, didn't have a lot of money. Uh, certain they sort of cub ebbs and flows of the uh, of the projects. Uh, we. You know, a lot of projects come in and they don't really have a 20-year life. That's what we sort of look at. Is it how can I have a 20-year life for the for the city of Montpelier? And uh, a lot of projects come in that don't fit that bill, and so we're not a, we don't feel comfortable uh, with those. Others that uh, uh, that have been done in the city of Montpelier, uh, we have supported. And so is so there's a very strong cash flow. I'm thinking of the uh, tennis court uh, project at the high school. Uh, the word went out. Money came in and money went right back out. That was a, a, a big year for the foundation. People could earmark money towards that through the foundation, and so that was just a pass through so they could take advantage of the tax, of the tax deductions. Um, I'm going to add one thing and then Glenn. Um, uh, to a uh, point that Ashley raised, one of the things that I um, that we, we sort of chat, chatted about before the meeting was about um, how uh, uh, the foundation's money is invested now and because um, right now uh, it's basically managed together with um, um, Maple Capital Investments, uh, which also manages the city's money as well. Um, and we're looking to do um, some kind of a revamp to our investment policy to make it more uh, environmental, socially, and, and governance uh, um, responsible. And so I, I am depending, like, um, if we end up going the, the direction of saying, yes, go ahead, be a 501c3, I would encourage you to um, consider having some kind of an ESG policy of your own. Because um, that, I think that where our money is invested really actually matters. So, um, great. Uh, Glenn. And uh, piggybacking on Connor and Jack, uh, in the how much are we talking about here, mm -hmm. do you have any sense of the general size of the grants that you would now have access to as an independent 501c3 as opposed to? Yes, well, for I mean, sure more. Actually, <laughs> are we talking like People factors of said, well, orders you know, of magnitude or? A, I mean, whether it's $1,500 or $2,000, I mean, yeah. if it's a business that wants to donate, they want it to be a 501c3. Sure, you know? yes. So if you're uh, the uh, Vermont Mutual Foundation, of which they have one, that's one of their criteria. That's yep. what they're giving their money to, is 20501c3. Sure. It's, it's, you know, mm -hmm. number one on the list. Are they there? Mm -hmm. not, then we're not going any farther. So it's it's sort of those type. Do we know what those are? No. All of them? Absolutely sure. not. But there are probably, there's lots of opportunities out there that we have not been tapped into. This state probably fairly modest, you know, yeah. two, three, four, maybe $5,000. Yeah. 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 And was there, did I hear you say that there was an opportunity or a, a, a corporation that was interested in donating and no, did not? No. Uh, no. Just hearsay. I mean, we, we Got it. Yes. Yeah. We, I can't. Th there, there isn't one. Yeah, okay. Uh, Donna. Well, you know, this technical language of your bylaws is just that. And maybe being, uh, sitting with it for a while, but also tweaking it to cover some of the concerns of how you all behave now and how you would want future boards to behave. And definitely something in there about your investment policy I think is important. So I would, I support the idea. I just feel we need some more tweaking to ensure that it continues in the vein that you've had it. Does that make sense? So uh, to piggyback off of that, um, I see three possible roads going forward, either the answer is no, the answer is yes, or we would like to see you all make some tweaks to uh, the, the document, the bylaws that you have um, at this point. What is your sense, team? Which direction? Can I just offer a technical uh, yes, point? Yes, please. According to the Google, um, an ex officio <laughs> member, the, the term means that they're coming from the office and they can, in fact, vote, debate, oh. or have all, all rights and obligations oh. of a board member. So, um, so in theory, so in it, the the board, so maybe if 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 you go the tweak route, you might want to <laughs> just write in it will be the mayor will appoint a voting member or the sit mayor or city council, an ex officio yeah. voting member. So, okay, uh, uh, Connor, you had something. Then Rosie, did you have something? 
Go ahead. Okay. No, just for a direction. Um, I, I think I can get to a place where I would support this, but some tweaks would be helpful. Um, I'm embarrassed. I don't, I don't know where the money is coming from right now. I mean, it could be like a Walmart Pocket Park. I, I wouldn't have a clue. Um, so having some ESG language in there, I think, would probably make me feel comfortable. Um, I don't know about the rest of the council. Um, but otherwise, I've been a fundraiser. I know it's tough. And, you know, whatever opportunities we can take advantage of, I, I think it's worth exploring here. So Rosie? So I would, I would be supportive with some changes. Um, so I, I understand why you want to do this. Um, but I would appreciate it if you could do a little bit more work to see um, if it really would be prohibitive of being a 501c3 if you had more uh, members appointed by the council. Um, perhaps um, a majority of members or a, a significant number of members would be appointed by the council um, if you really feel that it couldn't be all the membership. Um, and that would make me feel much more comfortable with it. I don't have a problem with it being a, a 501c3 for incoming contributions going forward, but I do feel that the council has a responsibility to the people who have contributed in the past to make sure that their funds aren't managed in a way that is different from how they envisioned. Um, and so that's why I'm, I'm concerned about giving up so much of that uh, authority over it. Ashley. Why wasn't it just formed as a 501c3 in 1993, four? Uh, the, the sense of the council at that time was, if I remember correctly, it was started out as a sort of an experiment um, uh, with, with, with the foundation remaining uh, an, as I say, an agency of the city. Um, I think it was on Bill Cole was on the council, and there were a couple of his. Chuck Paris was, Chuck Paris was, was the was mayor at the time. Yeah. And they wanted to um, they wanted to avoid at that time having to go through the hassle of creating a brand new standalone entity. It was discussed at the time. But the reason the 501c3 wasn't created in, in 93 or 94 uh, was, was, was to keep it simple, just to bring it into the city and, and not have to go through the rigmarole of setting up a separate standalone. It was more convenience than anything else. It wasn't, uh, uh, there was no other reason for it. We could have done it, 501c3, but nobody really had the heart to do it. Uh, Jack. I'm actually pretty comfortable with this uh, the way it is. You know, I think that uh, the suggestion of uh, having the council name, appoint more than one member to the uh, board of trustees is probably a, a good one. I'll point out that uh, I'm not that scared about uh, the idea that sometime in the future uh, Glenn and his neighbors will uh, <laughs> get get this uh, entity to fund the uh, Glenn Hutchison Memorial Park on <laughs> Prospect Street. <laughs> and, and part of the reason for that is that, sure, this foundation by the bylaws has uh, the power to, uh, to spend money and buy property, but it's not a park until uh, the city of Montpelier accepts it and, and creates the park and and so whether it's the Glenn Hutchison Memorial Park or the uh, Walmart Pocket Park or the <laughs> Koch Brothers Pocket Park or whoever you're thinking about um, I don't think that uh, that kind of thing would be free of city uh, city government uh, input before before it's uh, be before it's made, um, but given the fact that I'm reasonably comfortable now, if it were, uh, if there are tweaks, I'm sure I'll be ha I'd be <laughs> happy with them. Um, one of the other thoughts I have is that I agree with Rosie that as a council we have a responsibility to protect the uh, investment that uh, contributors so far have. Uh, have made in the in the fund. If things go the way you expect, the fund is going to get bigger, and maybe it won't. Maybe not even a majority of that fund will be 
uh, funds that were donated while it was a, a city entity, and it'll it will be subject to the fiduciary duties of the uh, of the board of trustees. So what I am hearing is the. Um, maybe two uh, tweaks to be at least looked into, one being uh, around uh, membership and the other around some kind of an investment policy. Um, do those seem like things that you all could tackle or yeah, look I mean, into? Absolutely. I, I don't yep. know how the, you know, there, I'm not sure how we can, uh, but I, there are people we can talk to to okay. get straight away. I, I, I don't, right. Personally, me, no. But, no, that's, <laughs> but there are others. Sure. Okay. Good there you go. Um, yes, Ashley. I just want to point out, though, that even if they present a, an ESG policy to us right now, the board would have the sole authority to change that. Mm -hmm. And there, there's no way for the city to, to do anything about that. We would have one voting member the, the way that it's written. So I just. Yep. Oh, that's a fair point. Okay, um, so I think we're going to move on from, uh, unless anybody wants to make a motion. Okay. Um, all right, thank you. Um, thank you. And we'll hopefully have you back uh, sometime whenever you're ready. Perfect. Okay, Great. sounds thank good. You. Thank you. Okay, uh, Housing Trust Fund. Guidelines update. Welcome. I'm Polly Nickel. I'm co-chair of the. Please, can the oh, can't hear you. I thought I was. Sorry. Um, Polly Nickel. I'm co-chair of the Housing Task Force, and I'm also a longtime member of the Housing Trust Fund Advisory Committee. And I'm Mary Hooper, and I'm a member of the Housing Task Force also. <coughs> and the Trust Fund Advisory Committee. And the Trust yes. Fund Advisory <laughs> Committee. That's um, true. So the advisory committee met last summer um, to make recommendations to the city council about spending money in the trust fund. And um, we discussed the fact that the guidelines for making such awards haven't been updated since 2010 when the trust fund was established and the city council adopted the guidelines. And since that time, the mission of the trust fund has expanded. When it was created, it was just for um, home ownership to help help first-time home buyers buy homes in Montpelier. But um, it's been used for a lot of rental uh, apartment projects that um, have been really important to the city. And the way the city council has dealt with that has been by waiving the guidelines as, as things have, have come up. So the advisory committee decided it's, it's time um, to make the guidelines conform with the actual practice. And they asked the housing task force um, to take a look at them and recommend changes. And so um, the task force created a subcommittee. It was myself, Mary, Joe Triano from the Montpelier Housing Authority, um, and Jim Libby. And then at the no, our November meeting, uh, the task force voted to recommend the changes that are before you um, uh, to the city council. So um, you should have a copy of the existing guidelines, a draft of the proposed guidelines, and then a summary of the recommended changes. And um, I apologize for all the paper. It was just because we reorganized them a little bit. It was such a mess with track changes that I didn't <laughs> want to subject anyone to that. Um, I'm happy to go through it section by section, but um, in the interest of time, I thought maybe I could start by summarizing the major changes for you, and then you know if you if you want more, we can we can talk in more um, detail. And again, um, this really is kind of memorializing existing practice and things that uh, the council or previous councils have, have already agreed on. So I'm, I'm actually going to interrupt you to say, uh, team, I assume the, um, um, is it safe to assume that you have read through this? OK. So I don't think you need to go through all of the um, pieces, um, unless there's anything else you want to add. OK. D do you want me to just sort of review the major changes or, or not even do that? Um, 
But you pulled them out in your first page. Sure. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're sort job. of, it's, it's really, it's actually quite easy to, okay. to read, which is um, wonderful. So you've, you've. <laughs> you get an A plus. Yeah, like right, that. it's great. <laughs> um, so I, I would just jump straight to questions from the council, if that's, if that's all right. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Rosie. So my big concern with this, and I couldn't quite tell if this was something that was in there already or if this was something that was added, but there was a um, prioritization for um, homeownership awards uh, shall be made for the purchase of housing by a household that is living or working in Montpelier at the time of application or has other connections to the city. And I'm sure this wasn't the intention of the committee, but um, it... That felt to me a little bit too much like, you know, we're protecting this homogenous community that we've got. We don't want to welcome folks from outside. And especially in light of Vermont's history with trying to attract just the right kind of um, incoming uh, residents and excluding others um, over, you know, the past hundred years. Um, I'm really uncomfortable with that. Um, and frankly, if somebody meets all our other criteria, I don't know why we would particularly care that they already have a connection to the city or not, um, and that just makes me feel very uncomfortable. I mean, at the time, that was important to the council. Um, we actually made sure that it only applied to homeowners and not renters because of all the federal, um, you know, fair housing and mm -hmm. discrimination policies, but it, it was in there. From before, from pre and, okay. and it, for you know, it was important in previous discussions. Do you have any suggestion, Rosie, as to how we could change? I would it? just strike that one completely. Um, it's all of priority number six, five. I, I think, think it is number five. That was number five. When the council adopted this way back when, I think the notion was these are funds that are coming from Montpelier taxpayer pockets. And so we want them to go back to Montpelier taxpayer pockets. I think w our committee had a conversation about it and we're pretty ambivalent about it. We could have gone either way, um, but left it in principally because it had been important to the council over, over the past. Fair enough, thank you. Uh, other comments, questions? Go ahead, Glenn. Uh, just on that, and maybe I'm not understanding it perfectly, but uh, if we were to strike it, uh, that number five, the money would come from ta taxpayer pockets and go to new, new taxpayer, taxpayer pockets. pockets. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fair. Other comments, questions? Does anyone have a motion they'd like to make? I move that we approve the uh, policies with uh, the exclusion of section 106 sub subsection 5. I'll second. Uh, further discussion? Yeah. I'm just going to note that in general I'm I'm still somewhat uncomfortable as we know <laughs> with the first time home buyer uh, uh, credit. Um, however, I really appreciate us making our laws and regulations and rules um, fit what we actually do. So I'm going to go ahead and support this because <laughs> that's really critical to me to, um, to have that line up. Okay. Um, I just want to check in with Ashley. How are you doing? Do you have th any thoughts you would like to? If not, that's fine. I don't mean to put you on the spot. I do. I have, <laughs> I have thoughts. And um, I, I support I support this whole plan. Um, I think I've, I, that's been like one of my sort of key issues in the last few years on the council. Um, I guess what I'm struggling with is is priority number five. I mean, I agree that Vermont has a really ugly history of discrimination and sort of selective, uh, you know, selective welcoming. Um, and I guess f for me, what I would rather see is is some sort of commitment. Um, rather than removing it entirely, sort of, a, I don't know what this would look like because I'm sort of shooting from the hip on this, but something, uh, you know, a, about 
what sort of other criteria we are going to look at. I know that we, um, you know, housing will be affordable to persons with incomes below 80% of county median uh, as determined by HUD. Um, and I just don't, I don't know that that does enough to sort of diversify the, the population that, that this would reach. Um, and and I don't know what that would look like, and I don't I don't purport to to say that I should be the one to like write that because I know that you folks are the ones sort of doing all of this work, um, but but I I don't think that striking five completely is what would be the best thing to do. I think that it, there has to be some like I don't know I don't know what it would look like. <laughs> Jack, but. go ahead. I have a thought. And you know, I've not been involved in administering these things, but uh, HUD has a requirement for to HUD grantees to uh, that they will agree to affirmatively further fair housing, and <clears throat> that includes all kinds of things from not discriminating up to doing some affirmative uh, measures to uh, to attract uh, diverse uh, residents and. Uh, it might take some tweaking of the language to see exactly how it should be go how it should go in there, but I don't know what, what you think about that as uh, a possible uh, additional criterion. Cl much closer to what I was thinking than <laughs> anything I said. Um, I mean, my uh, proposal at this point would be that you know if we vote on this right. uh, measure now and then just uh, you know ask the. Uh, committee to, to chew on this sentiment and see if they can um, come back with a uh, reformulated um, priority number five. Does that sound reasonable? Okay, great. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to, we have a motion and a second. Uh, further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 What? Yeah, no, Donna seconded it. Um, and anybody opposed? Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yep. Okay, pavement condition index. Oh, uh, we, oh I'm sorry. Uh, we're gonna take just a really quick break. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, we're gonna <laughs> come back from our recess. Uh, and welcome. I'm surprisingly excited to talk about this. <laughs> so I will turn it over to you. <laughs> Glad to see you Just guys. Just as excited. <laughs> <laughs> we love talk about pavement. Especially yeah. when you get to do it, right? You have some money to do it. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Before we dive into it, there is, uh, I do want to just make one quick announcement, which is that I think we're going to uh, rearrange the schedule again um, here, which is to say that we're going to bring um, the discussion about uh, the uh, former Moat property and the Old Country Club Road up to the next item because there are, I think, are probably a number of people who are here for that. And so to uh, accommodate the, you all who are here, we'll do that next after this item. Okay, take it away. Uh, good evening. And we'll try to plow through this and leave plenty of time for questions. So my name is uh, Tom McCardle, the Director of Public Works. Uh, Can you move the mic closer to you? Yeah, Tom McCardle, Director of Public Works. This is Zach Blodgett, uh, Staff Engineer. This is uh, Zach's presentation tonight, so I'm here in a supporting role. So, Zach, take it away. All right. So as we go through this presentation, if you guys have questions, feel free to stop me. Uh, it can be more interactive. We don't need to wait for your questions till the end. Uh, it's probably a little bit easier uh, to keep track of anyways. So first, let's start with... Um, the PCI and the definition of PCI, what is it? It is. It stands for Payment Condition Index, and it is a number um, between 0 and 100, which is used to indicate the general condition of the pavement. It's calculated by quantifying uh, distresses on the pavement. Um, I will quickly jump ahead to a slide just to show you different types of distresses. <laughs> So these are the type of distresses that we are looking for when we do our pavement inspections. Um, what you see in red, alligator uh, cracking, block cracking, bumps and sags, uh, patching and uh, rutting, 
LNT cracking, those are all some of the most common um, distresses that we find in the city of Montpelier. LNT? Long, longitudinal and transverse. Okay. So uh, cracks that are either perpendicular to the center line or uh, parallel. So back to uh, PCI. Um, when we look at, first of all, we, I would just want to talk about the history of um, our payment management system. From 2004 to 2011, we used a system called RSMS. It's a road surface management system. Um, that was used, it was uh, actually, um, you, uh, some kids from UNH would come in. Uh, I'm not sure how frequent they updated their... We, we did it with a volunteer annually with that program. Um, so they would come in, they would update uh, their the payment conditions. Um, and then after 2011, uh, we noticed some, some odd problems with the RSMS. They were using straight decays, so um, a... Uh, we'll go over how a pavement um, actually performs over you know a life cycle, but uh, their assumptions were that in year one through year 20 it was the same percent that it was dropping, and what we were finding is that it wasn't really true for Montpelier um, and for our type of roads. So between 2011 and 2014, I worked with GIS to integrate kind of something that was more uh, customizable for the city of Montpelier. Um, and then in 2015, we kind of took it a step further, uh, took that GIS and actually put it into a software called Paver, which is what we use now. Uh, our Paver system, we inspect uh, our roads every three years. Uh, so in 2015 was the first inspection, and then we updated our uh, pavement condition this year in 2018. Any questions before I move? So On the right. This is, this is a climate related structural subsurface distresses, a lot of reasons why pa pa uh, pavements fail over time, but particularly the North Country and our freeze-thaw, thermal cracking, a lot of Yeah. A lot of is, it, is this scale um, something like a standard thing within the uh, public works world, or is it something yes. that was developed? Okay. It yeah, is. it's fairly standard. Um, mm -hmm. some, uh, some systems categorize their conditions, and but in general, uh, below a 40 is, you know, a, a failed road or approaching uh, a very high maintenance cost in terms of either reconstruction or to rehab it. So it is an industry standard, but techniques and responses vary by region. Okay. So as I told you, these are the different types of distresses, so I will move on from here. Uh, just so you know that some of these distresses, they all uh, affect the condition differently. So when we look at distresses on the pavement, we're, if we have 1,000 feet of roadway, we're going to take probably two samples of 100 feet. So it's going to be 100 feet in length by whatever the width of the road is. That's your sample section. So we're trying to get about 20% of your, your road um, that you're actually taking an inventory on. Um, each of these categories will all affect the PCI much differently. Alligator cracking, if you have 100 square feet, of alligator cracking, it's going to take a very hard hit to your PCI. Whereas if you had 100 square feet of patching or um, trench patching, it's the, it's only going to deduct a very few points. These these uh, distress types are also very indicative of what's happening underneath. So alligator cracking is probably in shoving and rutting is indicative of poor sub base. So those are really indicative at the top. The surface, the pavement we all ride on, three to five, six inches. That's just for our riding comfort. Really what's important, it's what's underneath. So on the next slide, here you see a curve from, uh, this is actually from the paving software. Uh, they, they come out of the box with about 10 different curves. This is the curve that is most closely resembles uh, what Montpelier uh, is doing. Uh, so this is the one that our data is going into. Um, with, more, with more time, our data will actually be able to change these curves and uh, be more true for solely for Montpelier. Uh, right now, we still need some fine-tuning, uh, some more numbers to really uh, give an accurate depiction of that. Um, so the, red, the upper red line is like the upper limit, right? For, so when you do, um, when you do a... A rehab, uh, when you rehab a, a street, whether it's overlaying or 
uh, milling and filling or reclaiming, um, you could expect to see anywhere within the range of the red. So the upper limit, so at year four, uh, if you reclaim a street, you could have 100 PCI, or you also could have a street with a 77 PCI. The green line represents kind of the average curve that you would see. Uh, everything below a 40, we, we really want to kind of get everything above a 40. 40 is really failing. It's in pretty poor condition. Everyone's lives are kind of... So that usually is in, is in the reconstruction range when you're down in that 40 yeah. range. It's a, it's a much more aggressive, more expensive treatment. So the idea is to try to catch everything in the upper line um, and then push those lines out, so resurface at the right time, preventative maintenance work at the right time, and extend those curves out to extend the life of that investment in the asset. All right, so here are some of our goals. Uh, our goals also kind of closely aligned with the state's goals. Um, so uh, one of our goals is to have an average PCI above a 70. Uh, that's something that we set back, uh, I don't know, in 2011, 13 type area. Donna, mm -hmm. do you remember? Somewhere in there. Um, and so our target, target has always been a 70. Uh, the other one, which is, uh, it, it's kind of a new target. We had talked about it um, <laughs> with the committee, but um, we have a goal to keep 25% uh, of our roads less than a, a 40 PCI. Um, no more than ever sorry. reaching 25% of our roads. So ideally we're much less than that, but that would be the upper range. And I think uh, over time we will maybe adjust that percentage down um, as, you know, our PCI starts to go up. And it already has, so. So that funding level on the steady state is um, a funding, uh, amount of funding that, that uh, achieves these goals so that it's, we have, if you think of water um, and, a, and a hole and a jug, um, water draining out, um, we're, what we're putting in, which represents dollars, water going in, is at least equal to the water draining out. Water draining out is deterioration. So it's the it's the equivalent of that. So we're, that's what we view as the steady state um, condition where we're always making that proper investment. We estimate it to be in the $600,000 range. We've achieved that now with the CIP, um, somewhere in that range. Prices vary with asphalt. Um, so. $600,000 a year. Yes, and approximately. Yep. So here's a breakdown of our, our roadways. Um, our roadways are defined as class ones, twos, threes, and then there's uh, fours and some others. Uh, predominantly, Montpelier is made up of class three roadways, which are your residential neighborhoods. Um, your class twos are your major and minor collectors, such as Town Hill Road, Terrace Street, and your class ones are your, your uh, state highway routes, uh, Northfield Street, Route 12, Route 2. Um, so about 50% of our roads are residential. Uh, class ones are funded primarily 100% through the state. Uh, yes, we have some things that we need to do in conjunction with those projects, uh, but the, they pay for the payment and the life cycle of the payment is really on their dollar. Uh, the class twos, um, they are our responsibility as well. However, there are funds that we can apply for for grants uh, that we would get uh, on average between seven and 10 years um, for about 175,000. So class two town highway structures grant. I know this is a, this is a non sequitur, but uh, just putting it back on the radar, I think I've said this before, um, as much as we can be finding roads to unpave, um, I'm very interested in that. Just okay. putting that out there. Um, that is a, um, something we, we looked at a few years ago. Um, we did convert some to gravel. Um, they have to be the right candidate for that uh, to make a match with. Uh, um, so one of those is that it's an uncurbed street with driveway culverts, so an open drainage system, um, relatively flat, um, less than 5% grade. Uh, because of the amount of rutting that takes place, raveling, um, traffic volumes are fairly low, um, and 
keep in mind that it isn't an, a, a popular um, no, I, method. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear that. <laughs> but the other thing along with that point is um, – no, divesting the width of the road. Uh, we have a lot of roads that are 32, 34, 30, even 36 feet wide in a residential area, um, allowing, you know, we did this complete street study, and a lot in the report you're going to see a lot of them are shrink them down to 22, 24, um, which may be unpopular, but it's also something that um, needs, you know, needs to be weighed out. Um, <laughs> because it's, you know, a third of the cost to do something at 20 feet than it is, you know, 30 feet. So it's I, would, I would imagine, too, that um, that would be some natural traffic calming if the road is not as wide. But a little okay. bit. Um, it, it's your standard lane is generally 10 to 11 feet. So, um, I also look at it on the stormwater side, I think, less impervious areas, too. So that's, that's a good Sorry. thing. We don't need to talk about this. I, I yep. realize this is, a, this is not the issue at hand. <laughs> no, they're relevant topics. Oh, yeah, yep. All right, so here's a history of, you know, from 2016 to 2018 uh, with our class twos and threes, our ones, and then a aggregate PCI. Um, in 2016, we had a, on a, it was a 66 when you averaged our class ones and our class twos and threes together. Um, at that point in time, State Street was not done, nothing on Elm Street was done, nothing on Main Street was done, nothing on Northfield Street was done. Uh, in 2017, uh, you'll see that our class ones went way up, and that's because we did ter uh, that's because we did Elm Street, Main Street, State Street, um, which were funded through the state. Um, in 2018, we finished uh, paving those streets like Northfield, but in addition, we also put in a little bit of funds towards uh, maintaining our class ones. So you may have noticed that we did an overlay by the roundabout um, between Granite Street and, uh, well, the roundabout. And then um, we also did some wheel rut patching in between uh, Pioneer and Granite. Um, so the city is responsible for the routine maintenance between those major projects, which are on about a 14-year cycle. Um, the class one projects that are 100%, so we're responsible for it's like potholes, plowing, crack sealing, wheel rut paving. So we need to carry that uh, cost, and there is a uh, state aid for that based on those lane miles um, that we receive for doing that work in between the paving cycles. Here's um, just the, another type of graph uh, that compares actually 2015 to 2018 when the two inspections were done. Um, so you can see how the percentages have changed. Uh, this graph is representative of twos and threes. So when the other chart, this one, the class ones are added in and um, combined at the very end. This, these numbers that you see are twos and threes only, the percentages, because that's what we're inspecting in um, the state. I rely on what the state's condition that they uh, post online, um, and then so I use that information in, um, in in combination with our the information from our software, which is what you see here. Um, the low categories that failed in the serious are you see the same amount of failed uh, decrease in serious, <coughs> poor a slight decrease, um, but then you see good gains in the good section and the satisfactory. Um, so it's, it's really what you want to see when you're looking at uh, your PCI. What's our failed, I hope it's just one street? <laughs> yeah, um, so we can get the, well, truly, it, I don't know if it's technically failed considering every, we can still pass on it. I mean, you can get to and from everywhere. So if you look at a definition of failed, in my mind, that is you cannot get there. You cannot. Yeah, we call it unserviceable. It's, it's difficult. It's so costly to maintain. We have a 10 on uh, parts of Cummings Street, so there's a okay. there's a, a pretty bad one that that's is, is in the plan. And then in the serious <laughs> section, you would see stuff like Blanchard, Pick and Court. Um, okay. Scribner is a pretty low one as well. Yeah. All right, so this graph. Uh, a little hectic, but it shows the state trend, uh, the Montpelier trend, and then uh, both of our goals. 
So the dotted line that you see up top is a 70 PCI, and uh, that is our goal. That's the state's goal. We want to be above that uh, line all the time. Uh, down here, this is the 25%. Um, we want to have all of our roads with a 40 PCI with less than a 40 PCI. Right now, we're at 18%. It'd be nice to get that down even 10% or lower, um, and I think that's achievable over time. But we also it's not something that you can speed up too fast because we have other problems as well that need to be considered. Infrastructure, utilities. Okay. Any questions here? Just, yeah. One thing I wanted to mention about the bad roads was at the CPI meetings, you really make it clear we have to make choices. Do we put money to Band-Aid, a road that's really bad, when we don't have enough resources to do the utilities and everything underneath of it? Or do we go over here and try to maintain the ones we've got in good conditions? Because if we don't maintain them, they'll become poor and more expensive. Is, is that part of the ones that are still under that 25%? Well, we're, we're linked pretty closely with the water sewer master plan. Mm -hmm. uh, as you recall, we, that part of that discussion revolved around Berry Street, um, and that was yep. really bad. And we have a 100-year-old water main under there. Right. How long do we wait? Um, so we decided to move forward with the paving um, of that. We've um, been able to keep the water main together pretty well. Um, but uh, East State Streets, um, another one of those. Oh, it's a mess. Yeah. <laughs> so we have water main that's, that broke again just recently. So oh. um, so that that is a, a tough choice to make. Um, I use the word unserviceable. Um, and that is a point where um, the rutting um, becomes difficult to even to navigate with your vehicle. Um, we can't plow the street properly uh, because of that rutting, and so it's um, we end up putting a lot of salt on these streets that we can't scrape off. Um, so those are those are the choices that we have to make, and sometimes we have to move forward with some sort of a surface treatment. Um, Right, but it it's a Band-Aid that never makes the road really good until correct. you get the funding together to go right. all the way down and redo it. So That's correct. correct. That's, that's a tough choice to make. Um, yeah. I can give you an example. Uh, Walker Terrace is a street that half the street is in, you know, around a 40, and the second, the last portion of the street is very, very bad. Um, so the aggregate PCI is still okay. It's probably around a 37 to somewhere in there. But the last section is very poor. So uh, moving forward, we're trying to have a, a little different approach in towards uh, specific preventative maintenance, right? So we buy a little bit more time by doing this 100-foot you know, section on Walker Terrace until we get the funding for the water main, which is one to two years out. Uh, that way, the residents of that street, you know, they have something that's passable or more passable until we have the time to do the the money. The correct Walker Terrace is a 25, so it needs a water main and the sewer as well? No, just water. Just water. Okay, so here is uh, our PCI and then uh, funding on the right. It's a little hard to see over there. Um, but this is our, our PCI annually, and then the amount of dollars that we've spent on the right-hand side. Um, you'll see that in 2017 there was a spike down and also our PCI leveled off. Um, that's actually because uh, with Northfield Street that came up, we had to take some funding and um, move, shift some funds around so that we could do Northfield Street but keep everything on track. Um, so we actually allocated about $120,000 from normally where it would just been towards straight twos and threes. Um, to make Northfield Street happen. Um, as a result, we didn't get the same gains that we did in previous years on our PCI, uh, but I think it was well worth it. Um, the, the improvement is on your class ones, mm -hmm. so. Good news on that is we, we delayed Barry Street um, to connect it, to link it up with the bike path project, and we have a grant on that, and that will go this summer, so that will Great. make a, a pretty significant change on the two, so. Great. Yeah. Everything balances out over time. Exactly. Just as, as long as you all more or less have what you need <laughs> to adequately maintain. I believe we do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So some of the issues that we're having now, um, a lot of the low-hanging fruit have already been done. So 
areas where we don't have water, poor water mains or don't really have utility issues, we've already done the reclaim projects on those streets. So now juggling the infrastructure needs with the pavement needs, it gets a little bit trickier. Um, but it's to your question. Yep. So. Exactly. So we'll get more into that when we talk about the CIP um, and kind of each of the different projects and how they overlap and I know what is kind of con interconnected uh, with each other. Um, another thing is that, well, as we're talking about right now, the, uh, the underlying infrastructure can cause accelerated decay. So you have a street. Um, we've done some streets where uh, Liberty Street between next to East State, um, <coughs> next to College, uh, between Heaton and College. We've had, I think that was done in 2012 or 13, and we've had, I think, three leaks, four leaks there since. So that those type of things are really actually affecting your PCI quite significantly. Um, we have a, a short history with the paving software. Um, we just need to have some more time to do some more cycles to really develop uh, specific curves for uh, decay curves for Montpelier. Right now we're on a three-year inspection schedule. It's actually quite lengthy. I think that we're going to end up doing annual, annual inspections but splitting out the city into thirds. So one year we'll do this third of the city, one year we'll do this third. It's a little too... Uh, too much data crunching at the end right now um, to do kind of all three years uh, or yeah, wait three years to do your inspections. The other thing that we're looking into is uh, possibly having a vehicle come out and drive all of our roads and just give us an automated report, um, save some time. So. Does it, I assume that costs money though. It does cost money, <laughs> but time is money as well. Yeah, fair. It likes it because the state has one. So. Oh, well. well and it's, we it's reliable. It's not arbitrary. There's no it's human um, perception involved. It's, you know, taking points uh, every so often and aggregating your data that way rather than having a human you know, yeah. interpret. Right. So. so our approach moving forward. Um, DPW this year uh, supported our paving program uh, very significantly. We uh, had about $100,000 uh, that we would have had additional cost if we had done structure adjustments on both College and Liberty Street. Uh, in, in return, that ended up allowing us to go further on College, uh, do some of that wheel running uh, over on Route 2. Um, so utilizing our crews for uh, support um, is, a, is a really big item that we will continue to um, move forward with. The, some of the other things are preventative maintenance and interim maintenance uh, is a very high priority. So crack sealing, crack sealing, crack sealing. Uh, we did $14,000 in crack sealing this year. Uh, we uh, put 5,000 towards class one roads that were crack sealed, um, which um, not a lot of other communities are doing, but it's very important uh, because you, they only come around every 15 to 17 years depending on the state funding. So making sure that your pavement is good until you get the state funds um, is really important. In the local do in local streets too. Correct. Um, so as I said, shortening the PCI inspection cycles, um, continue to apply for our class two grants and uh, supporting our class ones with rutting and leveling as needed uh, to kind of preserve them. Are there any other questions or? That little paver you see in this picture is uh, one we bought a few years ago. It was a great investment, paved six feet wide. It's a sidewalk paver, but we run it on the street frequently. Um, so, you know, it's First Avenue this year, we, and um, we reconstructed one full side. Um, so it's a great little investment. Uh, it does take a full crew to run it with truck drivers and screeds and everything, but um, we also uh, did some paving of the sidewalks on Northfield Street. So it's um, it's come in really really nice with that uh, where there are pavement. Okay, Ashley. Have a, um, I live on East State Street, so, so I know how rough it is. Um, just a couple of uh, quick things. One, I assume that the amount of snow removal in any given year would have a pretty significant impact on. The, the road conditions in other seasons like I mean we, we've, we've had a lot of early snow this year so plows have already been out and so um, do you anticipate that being an increase to to maintenance in the upcoming years given the significant amount of snow we've had already 
Uh, it's more to do with uh, moisture, uh, freeze-thaw cycles. Mm -hmm. Last year was an awful year. We had very wet season, and uh, we had a number of freeze-thaw cycles. So that um, uh, frozen surfaces, the water is entering the pavement, and then it freezes, freezes expands, expands, pops it right. out, and Ooh, it's science. this vicious cycle. So crack sealing is, uh, is important. <laughs> um, what's that? I just, <laughs> science jokes. Science jokes, yes. Um, love them. <laughs> and then the, <laughs> the only other, uh, this is just Expansion. more. <laughs> this is um, maybe m more of, of a bit of an observation. I know we had a few early storms that actually produced a surprising amount of snow, but uh, I was in town. Uh, I'd gone to a yoga class early in the morning, and the snow banks from the sidewalk to the parking on State Street were really high, and there was actually no way other than walking in the travel portion of the lane to safely get to a car. So I just went through the snow banks, but there were a number of folks who were not um, as as able-bodied as I who who had to walk in traffic to to get into their car and so I just I know you guys have so much on your plates and it was a lot of snow that happened quickly but I just I wanted I meant to send an email and I didn't but um I just wanted to share that experience because it was I mean things could have gone really wrong like slipping in traffic uh you know falling in a snowbank and we, we are not even out of November, and you're, I know. Ask, and you're asking about mm -hmm. snowbank removal. I know. <laughs> I know. Well, the absurdity, right? But it just it struck me as a as a as a potential it is, significant hazard. It is at hazard. a point now to um, that we do need to um, plan a couple of nights. There's um, the crews work uh, long. There's usually a two or three day lag between the snow operations, active operations, and a planned night snow removal because it, it begins at about uh, 1 in the morning and, and uh, it's the only time we can do the, night, the downtown area. So in the meantime, um, we start to poke some holes around the meters for people to walk between. Um, we have drainage issues as well. All that water sitting along the gutters is blocking our drainage um, to the catch basins. And it's flatter than a pancake downtown, so it doesn't take much to create puddles. So a lot of reasons to remove the snow in November. <laughs> Further questions? Great. Well, I'm sure, you have, I mean, I've said this before, but I just love graphs, and so this presentation made me very happy. Um, I think there's a proportional relationship there. The more graphs, the happier I am. And that was, this was wonderful. You know what you graph that? I, we could probably, I think you could graph that. Um, <laughs> comment over there. Well, I, I realized I had one uh, other question, and that was in... Uh, in, in all the uh, graphs about uh, percentage of different classes of road, are those based on uh, miles of road? It's based on area. Um, okay. It's the most accurate way to put it into the system. Uh, so it's true area that, that the percentages are being based off of. So uh, a mile on a narrower road is less than a mile on a wide road. Yeah, so it's all about, yeah, exactly. Um, I just want to add, I'm really excited to have some of those graphs go up on the city website um, once we are ready to do, um, you know, um, what are we calling it? Performance measures? Something like that? Um, it should go up anyway, though. Okay, great. This is wonderful. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Awesome. Okay. So we are uh, skipping a couple items here and jumping to uh, the discussion around the uh, former Moab property and uh, the future plans of uh, what we want to do with that space. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Bill. Um, really, this is the beginning, I think, of a discussion. We've had, we've had some issues and questions come up about are there possibilities to do more things around the riverbank and open up more spaces and and what could we do with this um, with this former lot it's actually i call it the moat lot and jay from moat trust is here but it's really a combination of the moat vermont association for the blind and tks properties so three three lots that the city now owns and um i think my answer has to everybody when they've asked is that we that we have a plan and that's what's been bid and that's what's being constructed and the bike path goes through there it's going to create a roadway through it's going to create parking uh, about 28 parking spaces and leave a space for a new building and absent any change of direction that's what we are going to continue to do so 
one of the so I, you know we're at a point where we probably have a couple month window at the most to where before we you know if you back into when the work might start and if there were any permit re change requirements and those kind of things to consider other choices so uh, it's come up from council members it's come up from the council and it seemed appropriate to put this on the agenda and see what people at least on the big picture level wanted to do for direction and I think uh, I think the questions we have are, you know, do you want to stay with the current plan? Do you want to change the current plan? If the current plan changes, do you still want to include a private building or not? Um, do you, does people want more green space? Do we still want to include parking? How much parking? Those are the kinds of things we need to work through as we were going through. So that prompted this agenda item. So uh, just to add on to that a little bit, I think the biggest thing that <coughs> we need to figure out I would like to be figuring this out tonight, uh, is, do, right, so as you said, just to, to highlight, do we want to keep, uh, like option one is keep the same basic plan, move forward with uh, the construction of a, of a building on that property. Uh, option two uh, is would you, do we want to uh, try to keep the building, um, uh, but th there may be some possibilities uh, for just what's behind that property um, and in, in terms of uh, it's planned to be parking now, but maybe we can uh, rejigger that now since we you know have this parking garage that will be very near that. Um, and that's a technical term, rejiggering. Yeah, <laughs> okay. And option three um, is maybe we don't um, want a, a building uh, on that site, and that's uh, sort of up. F that what we do with that space is is up for um, more options as well. So, um, and then from there, whatever we decide, if we don't want to go with Plan A of uh, you know continuing to move forward, um, then uh, you know we may you know, try to talk a little bit about a process moving forward um, from whatever we decide we want to do. Um, does that make sense, team? Is that any questions about that? Okay, so the, uh, the way I picture this conversation going is um, I know there's a lot of folks here who have thoughts about this issue, and so I would, um, I think I would like to, s unless you all have things that you want to say right now, I guess I would start with the public. Uh, what are the what are the thoughts um, for people who would like to weigh in on this, and then we can continue to have a conversation um, up here. Yes, so if you have, yes, question? If you would come up to the, the mic here. Would it be possible to put a uh, image on the screen of what is proposed the current at plan? the moment? Hmm. I bet it's Sue can figure I that out. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's on, it's on yeah. it's attached it's on, on the, attached uh, the agenda. The agenda, so you could have. <coughs> <coughs> not not that agenda. agenda. If, if you have access to the internet, um, and go to the agenda yeah. on the city Sue website. Or anyone Should else be. from staff here that can. <laughs> I have faith. I'll work on it I have faith that you can figure it out. Let me take testimony. Um, Could, yes, Donna? Well, just before people come up, I did distribute a map that had one option of more green space. And I put th new copies over there, but I think both Connor and uh, Glenn got them last week at the meeting we had, the special uh, council meeting. So I just wanted to have that vision in front of you mm -hmm. when we're talking. There is a proposal about making it green. Um, Sheila, did you have a question? Or oh, comment? I, I was just wondering if you could repeat your name for the record. I'm sorry, Dee Dee Brush. Thank you. Okay. Uh, go ahead, John. John Snell. Thank you very much. And thanks for bumping this up on the agenda a little bit. Um, I think that the, f the first thing that I would ask of the council is to not keep going with the current plan until you look at other options. And then if you have decide that this is really the plan that needs to happen, go for it. I don't think it is, but uh, I think we have a real opportunity now that sort of the, the scene has changed and that it, it's very important to stick the stick in the spokes and stop it. Um, Ooh, that's harsh. <laughs> <laughs> stick in the spokes. Well, we've got an opportunity. Two, <laughs> two, two months, you think? Yeah, I mean, we, right. So we've, uh, I mean, 
yeah. that's roughly. But I, I, I'm just trying to. We, we issued a contract based on the initial plan, and at the time that design was done, parking garage wasn't really part of the program. So they're proceeding along, and so if we're going to give the, a change order and a new design, we need to do that before they start work, and there would be permit changes, and it would have to be designed and engineered and all those kinds of things. So, you know, that's the, the window we're talking about. And I will note that, that from the council's perspective that that, and I'm not saying we shouldn't do this, but just so people are clear, that's budget time and holiday time. I so, um, and this is an opportunity that only comes once in a great while. That's right. I, I have been on the original uh, car lot committee and then the Taylor Street committee. I followed this now for not quite as long as Bill has, but a long time. And uh, I would love to see something different than is proposed currently. I was really disappointed with, with it when it came out. I think that we need to look at what kinds of parking we need. And if it's appropriate to put parking there, then let's supply that kind of parking. Is it 10 minutes to go into the drawing board? Is it you know, Glenn drives these big cars downtown all the time. <laughs> is, he, is he just going to wear, warehouse his car there all day long? I, I don't know, but I think that's Typical. an important question. What kind of parking is needed? And I would advocate that almost any kind of parking can be uh, provided elsewhere or already is. Um, and that then would suggest that we minimize or eliminate parking altogether on this uh, three-lot parcel uh, and the associated roadways going in and out. It's a lot of pavement the way it's planned right now. I, of course, would advocate for more green space. I know that that doesn't come freely. We, uh, we need to, as a city, support that. But I think if you look at that, uh, that key entrance way uh, across the river and into this new development, the impact is huge if we have more green space there. And under the current plan, there's precious little green space. I know because I've reviewed the existing plan for trees and shrubbery, and it is painful, painful. I'm fine with a building if that's what you know the council thinks needs to happen and the, and the citizens of Montpelier. I think a, a well-designed building could go a long way towards uh, spreading some of the costs of providing more uh, green space. And I think also you're going to be hearing more and more about the Confluence Park on the other side of the North Branch uh, that these two could tie together beautifully. So please do stick that stick in there. Let's talk about all kinds of options. Thank you. And before we have more comments, um, Bill, do you want to just explain the, the location? Right. I thought about? it might help everyone, unless people really disagree, if I just explain how we got to where we are and what everything is. Now, I'm not going to have a mic. Can people hear me? OK. Um, this is Shaw's. This is where. Montpelier Beverage used to be, the uh, Association for the Blind used to be, this is the drawing board building. So the proposal initially, the, what was really in the works was the city took the three lots, sub, has recreated to two lots, and one of them is sort of like this and the other is the remainder. This was all going to be sold and the, the owner was going to build a new building and this parking was going to be associated with the building. This is before the garage over here was contemplated. Um, at the, near the end of the deal, the owner opted not to do that, and we simply purchased the property. So now the city owns all three. But, but this design was in, intended to incorporate the access to the back lot. This is the bike path coming over with the bridge, the new building, and associated parking. So questions that could be, and, and all of this has been permitted. This, all, this project has a local permit that we, we, we're not currently, you, you just gotta. wasn't me, because I didn't touch a computer. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sometimes you just have to be in the room. <laughs> it's the magnetic, right. Um, 
<clears throat> so we're not currently marketing this, but the thought was if we did, it would all be, you know, it's a permitted project, so it would be of, of interest. Um, so, you know, what does this mean? And, and as we have this conversation, I think issues to think about are how much parking is needed to support a building if we chose to have one there, and how much could be accommodated. Um, not really part of this, but as we talk about a potential bike path connection, some of the options include taking out parking on Berry Street, and would, sub, would proximate parking be of, of importance? Uh, and so we, we want to think a little bit holistically, but you know, could a road be recurved and create more space? Would you, the proposal that Donna just showed shows no building, the road and a whole lot of green space, not much parking, and uh, you know, I think those are the kinds of decisions. So I hope that helps orient everybody. So, and to be clear, this is what, this is what the bid specs, this is the project that's being built right now, unless we tell, it, w along with this. Um, unless we tell them otherwise. Just a quick question, Bill. That, uh, that parcel is in the designated downtown district, right, which has yes. no parking requirement for dwellings. Correct. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure about the, what the zoning requirement is. The biggest issue we've, dis we've discovered, and there are private real estate people here can speak to this more uh, eloquently than I, but we've discovered with trying to do the housing at one Taylor, we're trying to do this project, is that the financing of projects, regardless of our zoning, depends on um, the parking. So um, people can't get loans to build buildings unless they can demonstrate that they have uh, sufficient parking for their customers or residents, etc. cetera. Um, so new developments uh, come, come with that. Uh, Rosa. So. so I think one really important thing for, for me in understanding this was understanding that um, we can keep this lot for public use, or if we sell the lot, as we're, you know, we've kind of planned through this, um, the money goes back to the state and to the feds. So if we were to sell the lot, we will lose, we will um, gain some potential tax revenue for whatever is built on that, that private piece of property, but we won't actually gain the, the value of the lot. Um, and so that's a different kind of math than we would normally be doing in this situation. Right. And I want to explain that for people just to understand that these properties were purchased with federal and state money as part of a grant project. And so they were purchased by basically the federal government for on our, I mean, by us with money from the federal for public purposes. So as long as we use them for public purposes, that's fine. If we sell them to convert them solely to private purposes, those portions of the lots that are now in a private interest need to be refunded. And we've known that all, all along, that that was the case. Um, so it's not like we can sell these and just pocket the value of the, the lot and put into the cities. Um, before we go with um, further public comment, is, are there any other clarifying questions from the council? No. Okay. Back to the public. I'm going to put a, a visual up on the board, if I can. Do you, you want to also, do you want a minute? Like, should Dan talk while you yeah, find your can, image? Yeah, he can talk. Okay. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, can we stop? <laughs> Thank you, dear. Hi, Dan Jones, uh, Northfield Street, uh, Executive Director of the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. Um, six weeks ago, we held a roundtable of various uh, interests uh, in what we'll call the Lower North Branch neighborhood. Uh, Bill was there, uh, Rosie was there. It was a uh, discussion of how to begin to think about tying together the various we'll call them uh, silos of projects that were going on. It was the uh, Taylor Street project, the uh, parking garage, the bike bridge, um, which seemed to be the possibility of having a once in a uh, generation opportunity to rethink that whole area into something that was a hallmark or a gem of the city, not just a place to pass through. Uh, I guess Donna had passed out a preliminary uh, drawing that uh, Elizabeth Courtney had done. I'll, uh, I was going to have Elizabeth up here too. Uh, she's being demure back there. Uh, the idea was 
that by opening up what you call the Moat property, at least a portion of it, into public space at the end of the bike bridge so it becomes more of a park, now that you're developing, we're seeing a neighborhood develop, both with the French Block, with Taylor Street, hopefully with the uh, Christchurch development. We're having a uh, place where we're actually having people in fair uh, quantity living there. And so some kind of public space for them to occupy, along with the other people who would be coming through on the bike bridge, et cetera, is a, uh, we think, a crucial uh, way of thinking of it. Every smart city in the country basically opens up some portion of its waterfront, even more than the uh, Confluence Park. But, you know, the idea where people want to get to the water, as John experienced back when we were having the discussions on the uh, Taylor Street development, uh, there's a great yearning in Montpelier to be, have access to the water, and more of it, the better. So what we're uh, trying to suggest to you is this is a great time to change your priority move away from having to sell that because there's actual no economic benefit, and start making a gem that is the center, uh, a central feature of the city. Thank you, Dan. All right. Meanwhile, I'm getting there. OK. <laughs> Let us know when you're ready. For some reason, Do you want to unplug the, um, the, the projector the, so we don't read all your emails? That's, that's all right. You're, we're going to get there very quickly. <laughs> Probably better. I don't know how to unproject. Un it's not that hard. Sue, do you want to help, Sue, with you want to help me with yeah. that? Thank you. It's just, it's just my personal drive. What can I say? <laughs> Except it's up down. Uh, Elizabeth, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I, I just want to say a couple of things um, real quick. Um, can you get closer to the mic, Elizabeth? Yes. Thanks. Do I hey, have to swallow it, Could you identify yourself, please? What? Could you identify yourself for yes, Emily I'm, here? Yes, uh, I'm Elizabeth Courtney. I live on Clarendon Avenue, and I am a consultant to not-for-profits, um, MS, SMC being one of them. So um, I, I just want to say that what you're contemplating is a difficult thing. We're very good at building stuff. We love to build stuff Just a moment. from, you know, the day we're born almost. And it's really hard to give that up in order to not okay, build on a piece of land. To keep space open is not something that really comes natural to us somehow. And uh, it's important to do this because open space, they're not making it anymore. And if we don't <laughs> seize the moment and okay. use you, the sir. space that That's presents good. itself I when it presents itself, of course. we won't probably have Try another chance. Because once it's developed, it's hard to let go. Yeah, there so, we go. So um, this is part of a drawing. Is that Can the right we, angle? Yeah. Um, right, let me it's make an it axonometric smaller. projection, which there we go. can flip uh, easily. But this, this sketch is just to show that, there. Uh, <sighs> that Confluence Park doesn't need to be a postage stamp <laughs> um, down <laughs> by, the, by the water. We can uh, start at State Street and bring uh, some um, symbol of access through the, the narrow spaces around the parking garage onto the south side of the parking garage um, and ha have public space there, have public space along the, uh, the bike path as it crosses the bridge and into the area. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the little red flashy <laughs> thing. Um, but you can see just across the uh, railroad tracks from Shaw's uh, is the uh, so-called Moet property shown as uh, an open Look. space. Look, so here. Just <laughs> there this you go. Area. <laughs> All right. Um, so sorry. that's. 
Great. All I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Connor, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Elizabeth. Is it, yeah. So is that still uh, a bit of a road that would have an exit there by the drawing board? Yeah, uh, this, do, you see, do you see these little cars here? Okay, okay. Right along there. Yeah. When, when um, our group met at the uh, open space uh, meeting that Dan referred to, um, I think Tim Heaney was in our small breakout group and so was Bill and others in the room. Um, and Bill took the blue magic marker and swooped a road in that I, um, that is that road that um, the little arrow is on, thank you, Madam Mayor, um, that leads into the uh, Abishan and Jacobs <coughs> parking lots. And there's incredible opportunity to expand the park up, um, up the North Branch to uh, the back side of the Rialto. Um, there are opportunities, perhaps, with willing landowners to um, access the stream up there. Uh, and uh, the River Conservancy is exploring those options. Um, and um, we wish them well, we wish them success. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, While we're pointing out things on the drawing, I just want to uh, bring attention to the to the person in that park flying a kite. That is, because yes. uh, I like that drawing, and I think that that's an uh, I think that's an important part of it. We have our theme song, you know. Let's go fly it anyway. <laughs> Sue, can we get the lights again? Thank you. Okay. All right. Further comments. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, Bill, do we? Do we need to continue to maintain an access to that parking lot? Does the city need to maintain that, or does this that parking lot have? It does have two other access points. Yeah, we we, do we believe we do. We think oh, just yeah. for public yeah, access circulation, there's a couple of narrow access. The only other other one is the one out here on in, in that's trafficy. Uh, there's some delivery that trucks that come. Alleyway in. permanently closed at this point, or is that coming? That back? was closed for construction, but. Um, but it's not a good yeah it's not we would just as soon keep it permanently closed it's not good for vehicles no we think it's we think access and one of the this is pretty minor but just to be clear too one thing that can't change in the design is the actual layout of the bike path itself mm -hmm. that's been finally approved by vtran so just so we're clear of that that we're talking about other than the bike path okay further comments uh, Dee Dee Brush again. Um, I have a question about, uh, I had heard that there was some um, concept drawing about a building that would be market uh, price housing with parking underneath, uh, where, where I think in the drawing it showed nothing but parking. Um, and I wonder whether that's still even being discussed um, and then whether that would allow for additional green space where I think the drawing showed a building next to the drawing board. So rather than a building there, could, could there be housing adjacent to the river uh, with parking underneath for that and then uh, increase the, the uh, green space rather than an either or of all green space or all parking and building? I, I think there's a lot of options. Um, that, so that we did get that concept design. There was no, I mean, it was an idea. There wasn't really anyone ready to do it. Um, the actual uh, agreement that didn't end up happening with the people that were gonna buy the property mm -hmm. included the city's right to build above the parking lot for housing or to then sell that right to somebody else. So this, the council did preserve the right to build that concept that you're talking about in, in those agreements. As it turns out, we now own the property, so we can do that if we wish. So that would be a possibility. Um, and I, I guess another question is just how is this 
I feel like we're sort of hopscotching with many of our decisions rather than there being any kind of, I could be wrong because I'm not at all the meetings, but it doesn't feel like we're following any kind of master plan or design. Um, rather, we are making a decision by parcel. And I just wonder if this does fit into anything that has been thought through as a larger design for the city. I, I'm not aware of it. I'd love to hear, hear from you. Do you want to? Yeah, so the original concept, again, prior to the, the hotel and parking garage proposal was that there was a desire for additional commercial space on um, Main Street. The bike path has been a long design and that was where it needs to come out in the realigning of that intersection as well as access to the parking behind as far as, uh, and, and we did have some concepts for that new building in uh, some of the master planning and they also became um, this particular design came about as a, as a result of a negotiation with the people that owned Montpelier Beverage as part of our land sale. So, um, and then we just changed the terms of that sale at the, at the end. Um, but at that point, this was the, the construction design. So again, that's I think that's where we're having the conversation. And if I can add to that, I'm, I uh, would say that, uh, you know, as as far as the city's master plan, I don't think it calls for a park in this space. Um, nonetheless, we have this opportunity. So, um, you know, it's a, a, an opportunity worth considering. And uh, so, but the one of the um, con other pieces of context is that we have actually set as a council goal um, the desire to uh, have more parks uh, in, in the city in general. So, it's not uh, necessary. So, I mean, your observation is is well is well taken, um, but uh, you know, it it does fit with the the kind of thing that we have been looking to do. Um, and having said that, I mean, we have this opportunity now to slow down a little bit. Not not terribly long, but I think um, we have the opportunity to slow down long enough to consider the the greater picture uh, and see how does this space fit into uh, the larger picture of what we want for Montpelier. I mean, we are such a unique place with, uh, you know, the confluence of uh, two rivers. I mean, we even have more rivers than that, but uh, but particularly right in our downtown, that's, uh, that's pretty interesting and special. So, um, in any case, uh, I th you raise a good point, and I would, uh, as a part of the process moving forward, love to take into consideration what is the, the greater, uh, like how does this fit into the greater plan? And so only, thank you. Only one other m on point, and that is, um, I know there's, there's development for a, a number of new housing units uh, in town. I think, am I right in saying that the French block is, is it all affordable housing? I believe so. uh, it's mixed. Mostly, yeah. Mostly. No, it's okay. mostly. And then Taylor Street is that some market and most and also right. affordable. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, if it oops, <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't count their time. <laughs> if um, if there's an opportunity to have both some green space and some market housing for people who might want to be near the river and and uh, can afford some housing that might be worth considering. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments? Hi, um, I'm Richard. I live on uh, Monsignor Crosby. Um, I wasn't going to say anything because I don't really have any questions. I just have a comment. Uh, I'm a remote worker. I work online. Um, just moved here a couple of weeks ago. And um, I bought my first car four months ago, and I just turned 30. And that's been pretty awesome for me, and there's going to be a lot more people in my generation hopefully moving to places like Montpelier. And so the need for more parking lots, to me, just sounds kind of ridiculous. Um, I would encourage that we look at degrowth instead. I know that's already something you're interested in as a council, having more parks. Uh, that sounds wonderful to me. Uh, I've actually been wanting to go swimming in the river in the past couple of weeks. 
I need to buy a wetsuit, <laughs> but I don't know where to do that at the moment. <laughs> Park would be great. So, thank you. Thank you. R- Sorry, Richard, could you say your last name, please? Yeah, Litauer. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, so my name is Laura Gebhardt, and I'm the Executive Director of the Montpelier Development Corporation. Um, so I submitted some comments to you all, uh, but I just want to make some additional comments um, that while it's a uh, city council goal to increase parks, which I think is awesome, um, I do want to remind you that within the master plan and state code for planning um, is the goal to you know, channel growth into our growth areas and our designated downtowns. And I think this lot is a keen opportunity for that. Um, So I just want you to keep that in mind that this is an opportunity to grow the grand list if we put development on this site. I think there's an opportunity to do that in a meaningful way that incorporates um, green space um, and the shared use path and other amenities nearby. Um, So I think there's an opportunity to do some great things with it, Um, but I think there needs to be input from a whole lot of other people that aren't in this room who are affected by this. Um, so I would encourage the council to you know, reach out or have a platform for people to express some of those um, ideas um, in different settings because I think there's a lot of people that weren't able to make it here tonight that have some really important input. Thanks. Thank you. Further comments? Yeah, can I address council? Please do, come on up. Sure. Well, my name is Jay White, and I'm a trustee of the Moab Trust that formerly owned 12 Main Street. And for some of new faces, um, I think when Bill and I first started this project, we both had brown hair, so you can see <laughs> how long we've been working on it. I'm going to try to be as brief as I can. Um, I want to explain a little bit how we got to where we got. And I think for some of you, uh, on May 15th of this year, uh, a transaction was supposed to happen between the city of Montpere and the Moat Trust that owned 12 Main Street. And the plan that we had worked out, which we spent years doing, uh, was a plan where the city would acquire 12 Main. It had acquired the property immediately behind this. It had acquired the property on the side of it. A newly configured lot would be created, and on the day that we sold the property to the city, the city would sell back the Moat Trust, this newly configured lot, 16. We had uh, worked extremely hard to meet a deadline of May 15th, which is very important for the city to move forward with this plan. And even though an issue came up which was concerning for us, we made the decision to move forward and sell the property to the city so that they could move forward with a bike path plan. The issue, and the only issue that I feel that we didn't move forward with the purchase of 16 Main, was the fact that there was an unspecified amount of time that it was going to take for the city to do what they needed to do on this property. And in a nutshell, the simplest thing I can say to each one of you, think about if you were asked to buy something and then be told you will not be able to do anything for a period of time. And that period of time, nobody knew. Now, Bill and I spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out a plan. But as as May 15th came closer and closer, we hadn't determined exactly what that plan would be. So we did move forward with the sale of the property to the city. And I've been asked many times, why didn't you ask for some type of option? Well, in order to negotiate the option, it would have probably been more weeks of delay. And we didn't want the project delayed any more than it had been. So the decision was made to do what we did. Our interest in the project as proposed still exists. Now, most of you probably do read a local paper, and to my annoyance, twice I've read in this paper that the issue of the reason we didn't move forward was because of funding for the project. 
never made that statement, and I believe that statement to be untrue. So for any of you that read that, maybe that's why you thought why we didn't move forward. So you are now in a position, because of what we didn't do in May, to make this decision on what maybe you would want to do. But I'm here tonight to, to make it very clear to all of you that we still have an interest in the project. Um, and that the decision we made was simply to allow you to move forward with a bike path plan. And if there's any other questions I can answer for you. I do have one question. Your plan um, for the, the building there would also require on-site parking or would parking at the parking garage be sufficient? We believe in order to make this project possible, and this city commissioned a report that said it's not, that the parking is imperative that it be behind this building. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank that you. That without the parking, you probably will never see a building. Okay, okay thank you. Okay. Yes. I would just like to flag this parking issue. I, th I think I, uh, I, wrote, I raised this issue when we were doing the original zoning. So the fact that e basically every project that's contemplating putting in housing in these development areas that we've designated has to have parking, but yet the council last year removed the parking requirement from those areas, particularly the ones closest to downtown, um, you know, where I also live, uh, you know, the, the sort of answer was, well, that's too bad, but now if we can't do development because there's no parking requirement for these new proposed housing projects, I think that's something as a council we need to address through the zoning um, and, and not sort of make exceptions for particular projects because that's going to advantage those folks who can move into those new buildings and continue to disadvantage those who have no other choice but to remain in, in the, the lesser rent areas of those districts. I'm, I'm, we, should, we should talk more about that. <laughs> we can do that offline though. <laughs> Uh, okay, thank you. Okay. Any other f further questions for Jay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other comments from the public? Uh, yeah. Quickly. Uh, I'm Tim Haney. I live on Main Street. And uh, just kind of watching this evolve, I do think having, um, it is a great opportunity that's before us, or before you now. And thanks to a lot of energy and a lot of public funds that have gone into creating where you're at today, uh, my, my reaction at this point would be to pursue the plan you have and at least build the building. Um, I think there are very few opportunities downtown where this will happen in foreseeable future. Um, one thing to remember about this site elevation-wise is it's fairly high. Um, it's roughly 10 feet higher in elevation than the intersection of Maine and State. And with the new zoning regs and the new floodplain regs that go with it, um, a new building needs to be two feet above the 100-year floodplain, which we haven't seen one of those built here yet. <laughs> but if you were to try to build one maybe on the lot where, where Joyce has his park, I think you'd find the building would have to start about two and a half feet above the sidewalk. And on a narrow, limited site like that, it's really, really difficult to get the ramping and the access. It's virtually impossible. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas this site, you've already designed and permitted a building that will meet that code. Um, and I think that code is going to be a big challenge for the future of, of what might happen in this downtown. And this is at least one opportunity where something positive can. So Great. Thank you. All right, further comments from the public? No, okay, go ahead, Jack. Under, under this plan uh, that the city has now, is the idea that the city would sell the lot to someone who would then build the building according to these specifications? And do we have, is, is there a market for it? And uh, so do we have the, people want to do it? So the, the plan was somewhat as, as Jay White just described. What it, initially, the buyer was going to be the Moat Trust, and I believe they may have had a development partner and they were going to buy the building and the lot. So we've actually done the subdivision already and re taken the through lots and, and created them into two, and there's a permitted building, and the building permit shows these parking spaces. Um, once the decision was made not to go forward with that sale and simply have it, we haven't marketed it now. We, for us to do this now, 
um, because it was federal funds and we need to go through a public process to solicit proposals for these sites. We, we were al allowed to sell it directly because it was part of the, the real estate transaction. And I, I know that Jay knows this. This is a surprise. So we would have to put it out to proposals. But you've got at least one developer or person here saying they're, they're willing to pursue it. And we've heard informally from others that they're interested. Um, so there, there could be interest, but I don't know. I, I don't know yet. I think it, depending on what we choose to do, what the interest would be. If say we said, all right, we'll do it, but there's going to be less parking on site. You're going to have to use the garage instead. I don't know how that plays into the financing and those kinds of things. It may, it may be fine. It may not be. I don't know. Okay. Thanks. So uh, what I anticipate we should probably do at this point is uh, just go around and say w where we're at. And then from that, I think it'll become clear what, uh, if any, motion um, needs to happen um, at that point. Does that sound OK, team? Uh, and I'm going to take you know mayor's privilege and go first. Um, which is to say that, uh, I mean, this is uh, really strictly a, 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 in a really pure sort of sense, a policy decision. What would you prefer here on this site? Would we prefer a, a, a building with parking behind it, a building with no parking, um, green space potentially behind it, or no building at all? And I, I would say uh, my inclination here is to uh, uh, actually opt to not build the building um, at this point because uh, we could always change our minds later. <laughs> um, if we want to build a building there, um, it's much easier to um, to go in that direction, to wait, um, have some green space, and then should we decide later that we would like to build a building, we can always do that, but it's, I think, going to be basically impossible to go in the other direction. And I also, um, uh, from from uh, you know from, uh, Jay's uh, testimony earlier, as well as other conversations I've had, um, I don't anticipate that it would be very realistic to have a building there without parking directly behind it. Unfortunately, um, so uh, I I don't really see option B as it were as a as a legitimate option. You know, with a, a building but no parking. Um, behind it, and so it's either we're going the direction we're going, or uh, or there's uh, no building there, and that's what I I would uh, I would prefer. I think it's going to be great to have uh, space on the east side of the North Branch there uh, for people to uh, access the river. I mean, it is a pretty unique spot, um, and uh, I think it, it would stand to benefit all of downtown. Uh, to have, uh, as a part of our entryway into the city, uh, to have space that is green and welcoming uh, to folks and a, a place that's going to be pretty obvious for like, um, um, that, that'll be attractive for, for people to come visit. And uh, I think it also, you know, for people who live right downtown, it'll be uh, a, a park that is within walking distance, which is um, important. So that's it for me. Um, who else would like to go? Should we just start over there and just work our way around? OK. I, I think you all know where I stand. But before, I, I want to thank Elizabeth and Sustainable Montpelier Coalition for this drawing, because I think it helps to visualize. It doesn't mean it has to be this, but I think we should go for the green, and we should go to expand it as much as we can up and down the river. Yeah, right. I, I wouldn't say I'm sold on this particular plan at the moment. Um, but I'm curious enough that I, I think I'd like to see Plan B here, understanding the staff's under a tremendous amount of pressure the next two months. Um, part of my rationale for supporting the parking garage was we would increase the quality of life, I think, around the city by maybe eliminating some spaces. Um, and honestly, I'm not interested in more parklets at this point. Like, I'd like something that's real. Uh, seeing that on paper there, that's a little more real to me than building a building at this point. Um, so I'd be in the category of worth exploring. Um, I see the good of having a building there. I see the good of having parking there. Uh, I would say my priority is open space, um, for sure. I think that uh, I'm, I'm trying to think about it as if uh, Suddenly, I had more land than I did 
um, buy my house? And do I build uh, an ADU and rent it out and get really good rental income? Or do I, you know, make it into a parking space and have another spot to park? Or do I, you know, build raised beds or, or, or have a garden or, or uh, a place for my dog to play in? And, and in that situation, I would pick that latter direction. Uh, open space. I think that that's uh, the best, highest use of, of this space that I can see uh, in the future, and I hope to, to see it happen. I also favor the green space option. Every city uh, that I've been to and enjoyed, actually, and I, I don't appreciate being outside that much since I got Lyme disease because ticks are everywhere. <laughs> um, but uh, every major city that I've gone to, I've actually spent most of my time looking at stuff and things, uh, walking through green spaces, the uh, the. I think it's the Greenway in Boston. Um, you know, in, in New York, you've got Central Park. Uh, and um, even uh, in Oakland, there are beautiful parks on the water. Uh, and, and to me, um, you know, don't love being outside, but uh, appreciate having a place to go have lunch. Um, and also just sort of having a place to, like, go and take in the sunshine that seems to only live here three months a year lately. But um, uh, to me, uh, I'm not um, all that interested in, in another building. I think the, that uh, I'm not... I'm not sold on the fact that the only option that we have is a building. I think it is certainly an option, but with all of the development projects in the works, um, I, I don't want to lose sight of the importance that public open spaces uh, that really focus on all of the attributes that we have and we all love um, can really bring when, when people are trying to decide where they want to go and hang out for 36 hours. I think we're presented with a choice of a couple of options that are have both have the possibility of being significant public goods. Um, I'm I'm new to to this discussion. I don't know what uh, the potential uh, use of the building would be. Um, attractive market rate housing downtown seems like a, a great thing. Um, some commercial development potentially seems like a great thing. And I love this picture of the, uh, of the park and the green space too. Uh, I think I'm concerned that we really don't have that much public input at this point. And, uh, and so I think the most important thing for me is to uh, get more public input input before we, uh, before we make a decision. I have a lot of different thoughts, <laughs> so I'm going to try and make them cohesive. Um, overall, I think there are enough intriguing possibilities with this that I would take John Snell's advice and put a wheel in the spokes for a, <laughs> a month or two to kind of um, take that public input, spend some time brainstorming, and figure out what do we really want here. Um, and maybe after all that, it does end up being a building. Um, but I, I do think that there are some really interesting possibilities, including a few that haven't been brought up so far. Um, one that Bill alluded to a little bit that I'm really intrigued by is um, we're still missing a link on this recreation path. And that link is between the rec center on Berry Street, um, where the recreation path technically ends, um, and the uh, the edge of, of this property um, when it hits Main Street. Um, and so in order for us to make that, to complete that link, um, we're likely going to need to take some parking spaces off Barry Street. Um, so we got, I got some numbers from the city staff and it looks like um, it would be, ah, I'm missing it, 16, did you say 16? 17 I think is what I had. 17 spaces if we took parking off one side of Barry Street. Um, or 32 if we took it off both sides of Berry Street. I'm cautious about taking it off both sides of Berry Street in there, knowing that there are, you know, residents and businesses along Berry Street who do need that immediate um, parking space, but I'm really intrigued by the idea of taking it off one side of Berry Street. If we're going to do that, the parking garage may be a little far to replace that parking, but this lot might be just close enough to do it. 
Um, so I'd really like to explore that further, you know, and that maybe gives us the ability to do a protected um, multi-use lane um, along that one side of the street um, and really complete that link. And so, yes, that would mean parking on this spot, but it would also <laughs> give us more of that pedestrian and bike-friendly infrastructure that we've been really looking for. So that's one option I would love to explore. Um, other potentials are um, a potential, if we did this as a green space, a potential home for the farmer's market, a permanent home for the farmer's market there. Um, or potentially, if you took the whole lot, could we think about putting, I'm, I'm not, 100% supporting the idea of building a new rec center, but maybe if we w did end up going that route, this is the spot for it. Um, it is central, walkable, um, and a city-owned property that needs to be used for the public good. Otherwise, we forgo the revenue from the sale of the, the spot. So those are some interesting ideas. Um, another thing I've been thinking about is the fact that we because we have to send the money back to the feds, we don't need to make this, this, if we were to sell the lot for a building, we don't need to maximize our return on it. We don't need to make this a primo um, <coughs> building lot because we're never going to see that return. So maybe we take the public good stuff from it. Maybe we put some um, restrictions on the deed and say we want to see it used for housing or whatever. Um, and we get less money back on the sale, um, but it means that the the piece of property serves our, our public interest um, better going forward. Um, maybe we try putting it out to bid without those parking spaces and see what happens um, to see if there's interest out there in buying it without parking. Um, I'm intrigued by this, this design from the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, and I, I so appreciate their work on it. I'm really disconcerted by the idea of putting parking right up against the street. Um, and when I think about other, um, other cities, uh, particularly Barrie where I work, one of the things that really rubs me the wrong way about Barrie is all those parking lots right up against the street and not buildings up against the street. Um, and so I would personally rather see a building up against the street or a green space up against the street. I do not want to put parking right up against the street if we can help it. Now, of course, there might be other decisions, such as, um, you know, making that trade-off in order to put that bike lane on Berry Street uh, that would make me change my mind on that. But my, my strong preference would be to either face the street with a building or with a green space and not with a parking lot. Um, it, you know, and thinking about that, that uh, uh, design competition and how folks had hoped to maybe someday in a, a faraway future uh, have the, the Shaws move to the front of the lot there. Um, it would be kind of sad if we ever got there to still have this be a, a parking lot. So um, those are some thoughts. I want to make sure that I got everything. I think I did. Um, so uh, generally, my opinion is that let's take a month or two to think about our options, make sure that we've, um, we've looked at everything thoroughly as much as we can in a couple months, um, and then decide where to go from there. Thank you for bringing up all of the, the other options. I think that's um, important to keep in mind that there are, there are actually a, a lot of things that we could do with that space. Um, so one hypothesis is that we could have some kind of a motion that would indefinitely postpone um, the sale, uh, and which you know could be taken up uh, at some later point. Yes, Rosie. Sorry, it's I just okay. remembered one more thing, which is that I was thinking about how over the next year we are going to have a real lack of parking downtown as we do this work on the parking garage, um, and. Uh, you know, a, a potential advantage is that can we maybe do a temporary parking lot here to alleviate some of that pain while we decide what to do, and then um, once that garage is built and we've we've eased that issue, um, that we then are able to move on to do something more exciting with the space. That's a great question. Okay, so I I would I mean I can't make a motion, but one hypothesis is that we might indefinitely pro postpone um, the sale of that property, uh, so that we can pursue um, further public input uh, and take a holistic view of the needs in that space. Um, 
Yes, Donna, did you have something? Well, uh, so. It's framing a motion. That's good. Yep, ahead. and um, one of the other things that I would just put out there is that, uh, I mean, I've had lots of conversations about this site, and um, I know that there are a lot of interested uh, parties in what happens there, and so I would actually, I, I think one path forward it would actually be to um, ask Bill or city staff to uh, convene a group of stakeholders um, including the public uh, to work through the questions of what we should be doing um, on this site. Uh, and I mean, that in my mind, that includes uh, the Montpelier Development Corporation, uh, the, the Parks Commission, the Conservation Commission. Um, I mean, if a council person wants to be involved in that, this a sustainable Montpelier coalition, the Vermont River Conservancy, uh, as well as um, if we want to, is it, it's a Dubois and King that's doing this, the Barry Main, no, who's DW. DW, thank you. Oh, no, the people doing the, <laughs> the Barry Main study. The Barry Main study. study. Yeah. That's yeah. different. Uh, DW is a construction. Yes, firm, so. yeah, right. So um, the people who are basically yeah. looking at the, the connection uh, what should right. be done in Barry and Maine as well as the connection of the bike path. I think that's a, a you know, concern yeah. that we should be including um, in this discussion as well. Um, having said all that. Uh, can, I, can I just add yeah. one comment to that? Um, just to be clear as far as what's driving this. The, there is no active sale right now. So we're not, I mean, we're not postponing something that we're in the midst of doing. Okay. I think the the timing driver, just so that everyone's clear, is we've got a we've got a construction contract, and right now they're on this side of the river. But at some point they're going to come over to the other side of the river and start building what they've been told <coughs> to build. And so we need to give them different marching orders before they do that, or else we're going to be undoing something that we do. So, and and then. So, and I'm just backing up from that, and then if we're going to have ch to change, you know, because what's there is what's permitted. And if you so have, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. If you have different uh, language suggestions. No, I just, oh, okay. so I would, I, mean, I think what you're saying, if that's what you folks want to do, is fine. I think just to be clear that the, there's no sale that needs to be stopped. If any, it would just be to try to. I, to make whatever decisions we're going to make in time to, you know, in a timely manner to inform our contractor of any potential changes. And what is that? Is that two months? Three I, months? you know, we're guessing about two months, and I say that because, you know, we're in November, well, maybe, you know, at the outset three months, but you have to back up. If they, we think they probably will be starting over there about May, so if we're going to have to change, change permits, you've got to allow for that. And something new, unless we, I, you know, I'd have to talk to our DPW folks about what a temporary parking would look like. But if there's going to be a new road of some, you know, you have to have design, designs. You have to make sure that the turning radius matches and that, that the right surface underneath is all designed and the drainage and all those kind of things. They've all, that's all been reviewed by the state and by the DRB and everything else. So we have to allow the time to prep for an application for a change and, and a design to give the con just you know, we can't just tell them in May, okay, do this. There's there's a lot of lead time. Uh, so one because we don't want to pay for them to sit around and wait for us to make up our mind either. I I think it would be. I mean, I I like the idea of having a couple of months of discussion. I I don't I don't I'm mostly because I like to do things right. Like I don't want to drag it out yeah, um, I, very long, but have enough time for uh you know for a good public process. But um. In my mind, uh, December is already gone. <laughs> and to be fair, a lot of the public may not be available in December anyway. Um, and so if we can have uh, January and February, uh, if we could, that, at least that would be my goal. I mean, I know that might push it out a little bit, but if we can have something by the end of February, I think that would be uh, reasonable. Um, yes? Well, just looking at the agenda format here, that I guess. I'm leaning towards a motion yep. of d directing the city manager to establish a, a process with a lot of stakeholders involved, as you named, and scheduling for addressing the questions and making recommendations so that we could spend the next month setting everything up and have some real thorough discussions in January and February. Is that a clear enough motion? It's Are you good? Are you good with that? Maybe a little. <laughs> it's, right, it's right there in the format of the thing. It's direct city manager to establish a process and a schedule 
for addressing questions and making any recommendations. Great. Great. Thank you. And that is a motion? That's yes. a motion. Second. I second. <laughs> <laughs> okay, further discussion. Yes. So I, I understand that we have a few months, but I mean, supplies need to be purchased, labor needs to be scheduled, all so of that. And so that is is not something that they do like the day before or the week before. I mean, those orders have to be placed well in advance. You know, prices need to be locked in, subcontractor, you know, all of those things. So I, I'm just not sure how practical it is to sort of say like, well, we're just going to take a little time right now. Well, I think that's why the motion said f to establish the schedule because we need to we need He's to tie all those dates down. Okay. That will drive a lot of it because we don't we don't want to pay for something we're not going to do. Right. So and we need to talk to experts about you know what what our options are. Okay, further discussion. Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Great. Thank you all. I'm very excited about this process. I think this is going to be very interesting. And I'm going to go right from here into um, the discussion of Old Country Club Road, uh, th that property. Um, Bill, do you want to take a minute sure, or two to Sure. For those interested in riverfront development, don't leave, <laughs> um, because this is actually bigger. <laughs> <laughs> the city recently purchased um, a, a property, the, the last remaining, again, I'm going to get up, and be, if people can hear. The city just recently purchased the last remaining residential property on Old Country Club Road, which if you're not familiar where that is, if you cross the Pioneer Street Bridge, uh, you come left, you're going down Berry Street into town, you take a right, and it's the dirt road that comes down and eventually hits to a dead end. Um, city's bike path is coming down this road. Uh, actually, yeah, and, and so this was a residential property. Um, now there's, with no other residents there, we no longer have to maintain this as a public road. It's actually one of the reasons we purchased the property because of the cost of maintaining the road. But we are also the property owner of all the riverfront property there um, over the years, right of ways with Old Country Club Road. So uh, it's, it will already have a bike path. It's already got access. It, there's a few parking areas already established. So one of the ideas is this is a, a huge open, undeveloped area for river access, um, which you know is not competing with downtown interests. And I think tonight's conversation was simply, uh, how do we kick off a process to look at what can and can't happen there? Because this is a chance where you know there's no preconceived plan. There's no, uh, you know, there's nothing competing with it. So what would people like to see? What works best? What doesn't work best? We're not on a time frame. Uh, we're way ahead of this. Um, what will be happening there in the next year is the bike path will be constructed and, and, and quite possibly that residential lot will be used as a staging area by the construction company. But, in, but that gives us time to say, all right, what happens after when that's all done? Um, so I think the, the council has been excited about this prospect. We just closed on the property a month and a half ago and um, and wanted to discuss how we would move this forward. So again, I know there's a lot of folks here that talked about river access and this is this is really a great opportunity. Um, this at the risk of shortchanging some discussion, this seems pretty obvious to me that we would roll this into the previous conversation in that, um, you know, Bill's going to be convening a group of stakeholders uh, to figure out how to move forward. And I, I think that's really what we should be doing here as well. I mean, what do we do with this site? How do we want to um, design it? Uh, it's very exciting, full of possibilities, and uh, we're going to need a lot of input on that. And so uh, I think as as we're setting up the, the uh, previous uh, schedule and, and uh, process, we can do the same with this. And just to after have getting everybody all excited, <laughs> Oh, Tampa expectations just a little bit. I would point out that this is in a floodplain, and so n anything we do cannot raise um, 
the level of land up at all. It's been actually looked at very carefully with the bike path project. It's got Act 250 permit, so anything that's done would require Act 250 amendment. Uh, I think as part of our project, we have to remove invasive species. So there's a lot of opportunity, but it isn't necessarily a blank slate. And uh, but nonetheless, it ha would have. It still is open, open river land that could be used. Rosie, um, I would just. It's, it's probably a similar process, but I would keep it separate from yes. the other process because there's not a time limit on this, and it's a somewhat different group of stakeholders. Yeah, that's so. fair. And I think we'd be interested in those who are interested in working on this. Is it the, some of the same people or not? Um, Righto. Feels like it might be a similar motion, though, to the previous one. Establish a. Do we want to take some public? Oh ideas? yeah, but any public. <laughs> I was ready to just jump right to emotion. Uh, public comment. Up, come on up. This, I don't really need to come up because I just want to say this is wonderful news. If you would uh, introduce me. yourself. I'm Tino O'Brien, live up on Clarendon. Um, this is great news. I'm delighted to hear this, um, and I just want to support the work that went into making this happen. Um, and I'm sure we can figure out exactly how it pans out in the long run. Um, I, I would caution that I'm still looking for a canoe that I lost <laughs> right about that spot. <laughs> so it's not great canoeing right there. But, you know, it's still flowing down the river somewhere. Anyway, I, I think this is a great idea and I support it. Hi, Ricarda Erickson, and um, I also think this is a great idea. I'm really excited about it, and I would actually love to see a similar group, as you mentioned, working on um, the Moat lot visioning, as with this, and primarily to encourage a level of continuity with projects along the river. And maybe even this is a group that works on other projects, but so that there's a little more consistency from point A to point B, and um, as somebody mentioned tonight, not so much hopscotching and piecing together parts, but to have a real flow, no pun intended, along the river of um, space for people to use, and so when they're on the multi-use path, they're really seeing some consistency in design language all along the river. Great. Super. Thank you. Further comments? Okay. Uh, I think we, yeah, Ashley? I was just going to say uh, there may be a need for some ski trails. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, I know we've already sort of opened ski season quite early this year, but I think that should be part of the conversation given the. Yeah, well, it's going to be right on the bike path there, which could be great. I'm not sure how it connects to other. Yeah, right. Uh, okay, look. Ready for a motion? I'm looking for a motion. So, to direct the city manager to establish a process and a schedule for addressing the questions you're making a recommendation using the old country club road property. Second. Further discussion? All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Super. Thank you. Okay, moving on. How are you doing, team? Do we need a break or are you doing okay? I think we should keep moving. Okay, my guess is that we are not gonna be done by 10. Oh, sure. You think? That would be a great goal. Just putting that out there to the staff for the upcoming items would love to be done by 10. Okay, uh, number one, the, I think we're up to the master plan and zoning fixes. Well, Mike will be quick. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. Mike Miller, uh, planning director. So um, this should be relatively quick because I just, I'm here to kind of give some updates on two on your agenda, but I'll actually just touch on a third issue, which is supposed to come up next in two weeks. Um, so tonight, some updates on the zoning fixes, the city plan, and uh, the official map. So the Planning Commission had two major projects for 2018. Um, we were going to do the zoning fixes. As you know, we uh, adopted the new zoning in January. And shortly thereafter, a couple of issues came up that we found and 
the more we used it, the more we'd find little things, many just little corrections that needed to be made, and a couple of larger ones. Uh, the two bigger ones were issues that we have. Um, the slope rules are very difficult and prohibit a lot of development that otherwise shouldn't be an issue. So we needed some fixes for that, and landscaping rules were overly burdensome. And so those two sections really needed to get fixed. Um, staff put together a set of proposals. They've gone to the Planning Commission, and they've been working through that list, and we're hoping on Monday to have wrapped up the critical list, and they have one more piece left. So I do not have that list for you, and I will hopefully get that to you after their meeting on the 10th. Um, so the... They've been reviewing those list of about 100 changes. Uh, they broke them into two sets, the critical changes um, that need to get adopted quickly, which they'll get to you, and I will at that time explain to you interim zoning and get those passed into effect relatively quickly. What's your timeline on that? We're hoping to get that to you for January, and they'll be okay. in effect Great. by the end of January because they're relatively quick to adopt. Um, the second set of clarifications would go through the full adoption, and just because the full adoption takes long, that probably won't get to you until April. Just with the required hearings and notifications that go out. So I just wanted to kind of get to you right now, just to give you an update. That's where the zoning fixes are. You should expect a quick fix document to address slopes and landscaping in December. And the full set of changes would go through the warrant hearings and get to you in April. So, But while that's getting adopted, the zoning is getting adopted, they can start working on the next set, which is not only what you all have been very interested in and the public has been very interested in, but the Planning Commission has also been very interested in, which is the city plan update. Um, that was started... Uh, this year as well, it was a well. They had a well-attended kickoff meeting in August, followed by a lot of behind-the-scenes work on the Google Drive and setting up a bunch of things. Um, since that time, the Planning Commission, for a million and one little reasons, just missed a lot of meetings along. So they had one in August, one in September, one in October, one in November, because of snow, and they'll only have one in December because of where Christmas falls. Yeah. So they've just had a bad run of luck setting up their meetings, and so they really haven't worked on the city plan, but that's really where they want to start in January. Um, and so that is, their goal is to really put a, a lot of effort, they have nothing else scheduled for being on their plate next year. Um, sorry, can I go back a topic? Yep. Um, <clears throat> and thinking about the um, changes that we might be seeing in January, um, I mean, I just want to, you to know that I um, I have some worries about trying to make changes to the steep slopes um, zoning, and I'm I'm not opposed to um, considering that, but I uh, want to make sure that whatever changes we make uh, do have some kind of environmental protections built into them. I mean, in my head, it's it's something like. Uh, you can build on a steep slope if it meets certain criteria that show that the detriment is minimized and, and or you know having some kind of an environmental engineer sign off on it, that kind of thing. Um, so the requirement right now says that if you are have slopes <coughs> more than 30%, you cannot develop on them, period. Right. There is right. no exception. There are no waivers. There's no nothing. And what we have are people who come in and have, I need to put a culvert in to put in a driveway. The culvert ditches on the sides of the roads are three to one slopes, which are 30% slopes. I can't put a culvert in to build my driveway. That's it. And so we have no way of working around it. The rules are crystal clear, black and white, you can't do it. And so what the rules now would say is any impact to slopes over 30% require engineering and will require a hearing. Okay. And so we're not, we're not just letting people go. It's, it really is the changes are just minor to the effect of taking out prohibition and mm -hmm. saying you need an engineer and you need a hearing if you're going to impact 30 percent slopes. Great. Thank you. We can talk more about that then. I just wanted to yep. get the early warning on that one. Thanks. Um, so the, the really quick for, the, for the, the city plan is to 
what you should expect is to hear a lot more in 2019 about the plan and the outreach. You will be getting a lot more um, because they plan to have that as their primary focus. Um, there will be the adoption of this, these zoning fixes, but that really is going to probably be a minor piece. Um, it's something that they could take out a piece of their day. It's not the zoning we went through last year. <laughs> it's, it's not that all over again. These are many, many small corrections and a number of pieces that really just needed to be clarified or talked about. Um, so Great. those were the two quick updates. Um, the official map was supposed to be on the next agenda, but while I'm here, while we're doing updates, I thought I would just kind of go through that um, now because the next, next one is pretty, your agenda, next agenda is pretty busy too. Um, so I met earlier this summer with uh, Conservation Commission and a Parks Commission rep, and we had a lot of discussion. What we found was that what the Parks Commission really, bless you, Really, what the Parks Commission was really looking, looking for was a way to make their green print plan, which is a specific document that had been developed in like 2011. They really wanted to make that official and give it some standing and it was adopted after the last master plan so it wasn't included in the last master plan. They wanted it inserted in the zoning. We couldn't do that, but I really kind of misunderstood where they were trying to go with it. They just wanted to make that document official um, and what they didn't realize was that um, in the end, they could the council can just adopt that. They really want to have the green print as the official parks plan for the city of Montpelier. And we don't need to make an official map to do that. And in fact, the official map is not what they wanted to because they didn't want to take property. The official map gives you the power to take property and that's not what they wanted to do. They just wanted to make that the official plan. So we informed them that they didn't need to go through this. Uh, they didn't need to go through the planning commission. Um, so you should expect to hear from the parks commission on a review and adoption of the green print. Um, not dissimilar to what we did to adopt the stormwater master plan, the EDSP, the complete streets plan. These are all plans that we develop that we kind of want to put our stamp on that says that's our official plan going forward the green print should go through that same process. Um, we should review it and uh, see if it still meets what our goals and objectives are. And if it is, then we can get that adopted and they can start moving forward on implementing it in the way they want, which is to go to various property owners and say, hey, your property is identified on the green print. We'd li really love to see if you're interested in selling it to us. And by the way, this document has been blessed by City Council. So um, so the expectation there is you sh you'll probably hear from the Parks Commission um, and uh, hopefully I don't know what their timeline is for that but we would probably reach out to them and, and remind them that that was something they were going to follow up on. Great. There you go. Questions? Awesome. Yes, Donna. You, you mentioned there was going to be some follow-up to the meetings dealing with the city plan that they had the pavilion of all the committees. Has there been anything written about that meeting or any summation? We at compiled all the notes, all the things that had been written down. I think um, Barb Conray was the, the kind of the scribe right, up on the stage. Right. We, we've transcribed all of those notes and we've started to pull things together. The easiest place where this is going to start to come together is when we start to get the, uh, the Google Drive we're putting together and start to make that, give it a public <laughs> face to it. Because the hope is we'll start be, being able to collect from each committee their, their individual pieces and having a place where people can see what's going on. And then the Planning Commission will start to pull those pieces into documents that we can put on the drive and, and try to put and all so that then together. Elements of that then will become part of the city plan. Yes. Okay. Yep. We don't want to lose it. No, we definitely don't want to. Okay. Further questions? Okay. Oh, yeah. Please go ahead. Laura Rose Abbott. I was just wondering about the critical <laughs> changes. When they go to the council, will that, it, it's saying it's not going to have the full review process. Will it still have a public, public hearing process? Yes, certainly. Thank you. Yep. Uh, for the, for the um, interim? 
interim there's two yes. different processes there's one for interim zoning and one for the full hearing Mike could probably explain the difference between the two thank you for that clarification and I'm sorry would you mind repeating your name Thank you. So you want me to explain that Just really quickly? Quick? Okay. Yeah. So the interim zoning will have a process. Full full zoning adoption has a public hearing by the planning commission, and then there's 30 day time windows, and then the city council has one or two. It's always confusing because they make them slightly different between the adoption of a plan and adoption of regulations. But I believe there are two hearings you would have in an interim. Um, you would go through and have uh, a meeting and then you'd have one hearing on it. And the reason why the shorter window is allowed is because it's, it is an interim, which means it's a temporary. So all of those temporary changes would also be included in this permanent update that's going through the full process. So you usually go through, you make an interim change because, boy, we've got to fix these rules because it's making a mess of the zoning process. So we'll make an interim fix while we go through the permanent adoption. So the January um, proposals will be for interim For the zoning? interim, yeah, okay. just to make those changes to the, okay. to the slope rules and to the landscaping rules. And the first meeting we would have would be to discuss, do you want to adopt them? Mm -hmm. And you may decide we're willing to adopt the landscaping but not the slopes because I don't think the slopes are ready. We want that to go through a full process, whatever. Okay. That's, that's what the first meeting is, and the second meeting would be basically like a first reading and a second reading type. Okay. But there will be public. Plenty of public comment. Yep. Definitely. There's public comment for the interim, but there's a lot of public comment for the full, full adoption, as you guys have experienced. Okay. Thank you. Great. Okay. Any further questions? Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Okay. Next up is the budget discussion. While Todd's setting up, I'll just uh, tee this up. Uh, we had a discussion with you folks uh, saying that you wanted to be looped in early in the budget process. So we have not had, um, we don't have our full budget compilation yet. We had a preliminary meeting yesterday. Our full team effort is next week when we'll be really putting the, the pen to paper and, and all that, but what I think I hope Todd has come up with is a, <laughs> is a, basically an outline of the four major categories of our budget. What what doing same thing next year looks like, you know this year to next year looks like, and then what is on the table for possible changes, the things that you've suggested, things that others have suggested, and it's really just to give you a chance to have an early way in about what's important or. If you want to prioritize things, these are the, a lot of the stuff is stuff you've heard before, either from staff or from yourselves. Um, but anyway, I'll turn it over to Todd. Yeah. So this wasn't an attachment. This was not an attachment. This is a, a work in process that has uh, that Bill has not even had the privilege of, of seeing. Yet, sometimes yet. we get it in a separate email. Yep. I yeah. No, I haven't even seen this. This so has uh, been a work I'm in anxious. process, and we've we've discussed it, and there is no decision making that needs to happen tonight. So <laughs> Keep in mind that this is the end of the evening. I realize that I'm not putting anyone on the spot. Um, and I will send distribute uh, copies to everybody. Um, what I am trying to present to you here is just a baseline um, kind of budget discussion, preliminary budget discussion before we have a, our final um, sit down with the department heads. We'll work on this for a couple of days and go through and hash out um, different items. But essentially what we're looking at here is on um, the first uh, the highlighted item, uh, which is the core government services here, um, that is essentially maintaining a baseline. Now, let's not do anything, make any changes. Let's just continue our operations into next year. We're looking at plus or minus, you know, just a little over three hundred thousand dollars of an increase. That is, you know, increases for health insurance. That's increases for wages for contractual um, union contract issues. That's presuming you know a two percent increase for personnel plan employees those types of baseline fundamentals um, what that number does not include is new requests so what I've tried to do on the right hand side is just give to you an idea and a, a scope of what we're looking at for new items 
Um, and can everyone see that okay? Is that a... Can you make it a little bigger? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll make this a little bit. I'm, <laughs> I'm also, I'm just 25 part nine now, and my eyesight seems to have gotten exponentially yeah. worse. So um, in addition to, you know, maintaining our baseline, what we're looking at for various requests and requests that we've discussed here at, at the council level um, are items that enhance our existing services, adding a new police officer. There's been discussion of a facilities manager. There's discussion of an energy manager. Um, I put an <coughs> asterisk next to facility and energy manager because they're seems to be some synergy between those two positions potentially and maybe we have an opportunity to uh, to merge that into one um, there's a request for an additional park staff person there's also a request for a tree staff person that would be dedicated more to the emerald ash borer problem um, going forward um, there's been discussion of fuel alternatives and seeking out um, different options for uh, fleet fuels so at present we don't have a really good option but there is a renewable diesel option that is um, coming to the market and i'm not going to say it's available to us now uh, but in fy20 it's a it's a real possibility so there uh, would be potentially some premium but that is a developing story um, we also have to look at our network security issues our um, data storage. I think we've all come to the realization, me begrudgingly at least, that um, cloud-based solutions uh, for a lot of our data is becoming more and more of a necessity. Uh, individually maintaining uh, networks and servers and the infrastructure cost that goes along with that um, comes at a cost, uh, both in maintaining the equipment and uh, the staff to and contractual obligations to maintain it. Uh, and warranty services. So that's, you know, a potentially wide open <laughs> item that could, you know, really, really jump uh, the cost uh, dramatically. But there are some offsets as well. Uh, there's also data requirements that are statutory in nature. Uh, police department, for instance, um, you know, as we're currently using uh, cruiser video cameras and, and those, that video data needs to be backed up. Uh, Currently, we do some of that on site and some of it off site, but moving uh, more of that to a cloud based solution is um, something that uh, we should be addressing in FY20. New building maintenance there's going to be some maintenance requirements associated with buildings such as One Taylor Street. Um, we're in the process of building it now, but setting, creating a reserve or creating uh, some sort of set aside for the future uh, repairs and maintenance that need to happen on those buildings. Um, I mentioned cruiser cameras, body cameras is kind of a policy issue that's been discussed. Uh, and I know Tony was here recently um, talking about that. That's a, a discussion item that we're gonna be going through as well. Is there, sorry, oh, yeah. is there a request right now to upgrade cruiser cams as well as, okay. No. So it's just no, about it's, body cams, it's just the storage piece. It's the storage it. component of that, yep. Um, and then from the city manager's office, and I think the council has expressed some interest in doing a citizen survey as well, um, some cost in, in hiring that out. So those are some of the um, items that we'll be discussing next week. And what I'm looking, not so much for answers from council this evening, but um, just to get feedback if you have any that is going to direct our conversations. Um, as we go through this, because we don't want to miss something that's uh, a major concern for you. Uh, can, you moving, tell, yep. can you tell us that $300,000 baseline mm -hmm. change, what is that in a percent increase? That is just about 3%, okay. depending on how you play the grand list. It's over here, I've um, indicated that, you know, one for discussion purposes at least, and rounding purposes, 1% is about one cent, which equals about $100,000, okay. just for, for round uh, numbers. Uh, debt and capital projects, um, we have planned on increasing uh, the capital projects budget by about $50,000 uh, this year. Um, that is always, I've got asterisks here as well, that number fluctuates a little bit because if we fund a capital project with debt, once that final debt is issued, that offsets the amount that's available for capital projects. 
some of the big items that are on the list for this year are um, street lights. There's been an ongoing um, need to upgrade some of the street lights downtown into LED, but there's some wiring that goes along with that, which is a fairly significant project. Portions of the roof of this building um, are, if not in immediate need, in the very near term. Um, there's need for replacement there. Uh, fire equipment continues to be on the radar every single year. And the reason it's on the radar every year is because it's so expensive. Um, so even if we're not purchasing anything, we need to be talking and planning for uh, future purchases because of, you know, a new tower truck might be $800,000. Um, energy improvements uh, kind of goes along with energy manager, facility manager, and how much do we want to dedicate to weatherization of city-owned buildings and improving the energy uh, efficiency of, of each building that we have, whether it be lights or heating supplies or um, water and sewer even. Um, moving down, and Bill, feel free to cut in at any time uh, if, you, if I have miscategorized anything. Um, Memberships that we currently have, uh, you know, we are members of VLCT. I think we uh, get a tremendous value for our membership there. Uh, we also, VLCT also provides our property and liability insurance and workers' compensation insurance. Um, so, and they have been a, a great partner. That's money well spent. Uh, Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, um, we use tremendously for GIS and mapping and planning related <coughs> resources. Uh, outside entities are things that are on or included in our budget that we raise, essentially raise money for, but we don't necessarily have direct control over them as agencies. So these are the various agencies <laughs> within that subset um, that are autonomous to our operation, that are not under direct uh, city council control, but that we raise funding for. I thought our Green Mountain Transit was like 40000 So... Green Mountain Transit has, there's a uh, per capita uh, okay. component of 30-ish and then 40 for the circulator service or okay, vice versa. it's just the circulator that's yeah. like that. Okay. And the CVPSA, I, I know that that's historically been included in the budget, but net with the impending resignation of the executive director, I, I guess, and I missed the last meeting, so I was not, not yep. feeling well, but... That it, <laughs> we don't have a formal request, so right. th this is where we're at right now. So we're anticipating things that have been in the budget and just trying to break out for you folks the buckets that they kind of go in that yes. we think about them as. The request comes from these agency, including right. I, I guess authority. it just it would. I mean, if this is being sort of included in that, there's been no formal request. It doesn't seem as though. So, to your to your point, Ashley, though the um, that that twenty eight thousand that's included there is not included in this baseline. It is broken out separately. Okay. Um, so if that were to go away, it would be a direct reduction. If it were to increase, it would be a direct increase to mm -hmm. the overall um, package. I just uh, want to be clear that I would not support paying that <laughs> right now. <laughs> <Really> noted. <laughs> um, Community enhancements are, uh, you know, mostly Montpelier Alive and those related fundamental um, things that we participate in, you know, the 4th of July celebration, the welcome legislators, dinner, um, holiday lights. We make a contribution each year to the USS Montpelier to um, help uh, assist in the housing costs for the, for the sailors when they come to visit for the 4th of July. Um, so that's kind of those small but... Um, and just to be clear, the, the top line comes from the downtown improvement district tax. So it's... it's so that is a separate tax, uh, and that's a essentially a direct pass-through. Um, and then we get into policies and relationships and things that council has taken um, a stance on uh, in years past, um, and I'm presuming will continue to do so. Uh, the Montpelier Development Corp, there was, uh, for economic uh, development within town, there was a, a um, commitment for $100,000 a year. The Montpelier Community Fund, uh, slightly lower last year because we had some changes in one of the underlying um, recipients, but has historically been $120,000. Uh, MEAC, 
in years past has been 5,000. I'm holding the line on that. Their request primarily has been um, not so much in the operating expenses, but in, in um, moving forward with an energy manager type position uh, that could see some of these projects through. Uh, the housing trust fund, again, last two years has been at, or last year was at 60,000. I'm holding that at 60, but the request was for 150,000, and I think that happened a couple of months ago. Um, so that would be a projected increase of $90,000. Uh, there was recently a request for, from Art Synergy and Paul Gamble at a prior meeting uh, for $50,000 in funding for art related projects in the downtown. Uh, invasive, invasive species, uh, th that is um, of the plant nature, so <laughs> poison ivy and goats and those types of uh, <laughs> treatments. And then invasive insects, uh, and this would be in addition to uh, staffing for treatment of ash borers and, and the related um, operating side of that. Uh, That gives you a very quick synopsis. What I wanted to do as well, though, was kind of come back here. Um, and when I was, when I met with you about a month ago, um, we had gone through kind of person by person and just made a, a bulleted list of, you know, what's important to you um, before, as we start this, this process. And all, all I did here was just kind of color code things that um, were mentioned by multiple people. Uh, so I don't need to belabor this, and I will send this to you in a, um, in a summary. But, you know, energy and facility manager came up. Housing trust fund came up more than once. Police officer came up more than once. Uh, ash borer came up more than once. Um, so those are the kind of the highlights that I'm looking at going into our discussions uh, as, a, as a management group. And again, I'm just looking to get feedback from any of you if you have it with regard to are we going off the rails here or going in the wrong direction or is there anything you want to... Um, Was that at the meeting that I missed? I may have been. Okay. <laughs> no, actually, no, no you weren't, you weren't, because uh, you're on the bottom here. Wait, hold on, hold on. Oh. Uh, so it was, uh, you had brought up uh, the amount, whether we could oh, you're right. yep, I bring someone in-house okay. to, um, <laughs> uh, to address the cost of studies and then clearly identifying the outcomes. Thank you. And ash borers is what was also on your list. I get one sort of question that I have. I know uh, Chief came and talked sort of generally about body cams. I know state police are also trying to figure out what that would look like. It's certainly something, you know, I am in favor of, but I, I'm wondering if it seems realistic that, that if we were to allocate those funds for this year, if all of those sort of issues would be able right. to be addressed in this this fiscal year, this upcoming fiscal year, or if that's something where, uh, you know, we engage in the policy planning process because that takes a long time given the myriad of concerns. Um, and I was just curious if there had been. Yeah, so I think, you know, Tony, uh, you know, the, that, that's a decision obviously for council and, and for police. Um, I, it's it's a, dollars. no, I, we haven't, you know, I have some estimates of what it would cost. Right. Uh, you know, initial investment in body cams, $6,000 for discussion purposes. Uh, annual fees for storage of all that data after you get it, yeah. 15000 <laughs> So, you know, we're right around, it's a $20,000 a year commitment. But beyond that, you know, it really is policy and, and all the other issues that go along with having that, that data. Um, that is the bigger concern. And then also, you know, here we are, it's November 28th. Is right. it realistic that we're going to want to do it? in you know before and that's a conversation we're having to 20 too. so those are the types of like we said we we haven't made any decisions either this is kind of the you know we've consolidated a lot of the information and the requests so we're about to go into our you know closed door lock knock down drag out meeting to decide all this stuff but we wanted to run the, the decisions we're going to be looking at to get um feedback from any of you as we and I mean, I know, I know this is always a little strange, but to me, 
and I know that we as a council right now can't bind the next council into things, but uh, you know, I would I would certainly I am in favor of you know MPD adopting body cams as as a sort of standard practice, but you know, the policy planning and coordination piece of that needs to be not just with MPD, but it's on a much larger scale, especially since the legislature may be taking the issue up. And so I I am supportive of that, although it, it strikes me as someone who's, you know, sort of been doing law enforcement policy development over mm -hmm. the years, that that's something that's going to happen in, in a very quick fashion. And so I, I wonder if it might make sense for us to... Um, as a council, if, if everyone is willing to commit to that, like, you know, sort of adding that to the next fiscal year's budget plan, mm -hmm. uh, rather than, I mean, earmarking funds now and then not using sure. them. Sure. Um, and I know that you can't sort of marry the next council to that, but it just seems like there are other ways that we could be using some of those dollars now rather than just as a, as a placeholder and allocating Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and that's you know, so. those are the types of discussions that we'll have in our, uh, <laughs> in and, our and some of those newer positions like a facilities manager and things like that, like really drilling down with city staff what that mm -hmm. job description would look like, rather than sort of you know allocating something then realizing it's not enough money that we've allocated to get the the person with the skills that we need, you know, and so maybe prioritizing those things, you know, in terms of what is feasible right now, right? We could hire a police officer right now. All of the things exist for the training, you know, the academy attendance, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the Emerald Ash Borer, you know, we have the resources to tackle all of that and, and then sort of spend the next year making sure. sure that we're putting plans in place to do the these other things that are really important things. But right. can you go back to that, uh, the spreadsheet sure. uh, with the, the different categories. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I mm -hmm. there are some things on this list that uh, I really want to push for, and there are some things that I want but don't cost very much. And so, like for example, like I love the goats, mm -hmm. right? Like, but that's two thousand four four thousand dollars. Like that's not very much money. Um, so I'm going to leave that on the side. So but the things that, that are rather big that I want to push for, I just want to tell you, like, I have a list of priorities for, like, things. If I had to choose an order for things on this list, what would my, the, my priorities be? Number one is the police officer, the extra police officer. Number two is some kind of a combined um, facilities director and sustainability coordinator. Um, Number three is taking care of money for the emerald ash borer, which I think maybe that I don't know how the parks fits in for that for me, but emerald ash borer is right up there. Um, number four for me is the housing trust fund, and number five is art synergy money. There we go. I challenge you all. <laughs> Do you have a priorities list? I I would agree. For me, the police officer is probably one of the highest priorities. I, I mean, you've got officers who are working a lot yeah. right now. Um, yeah. Having, oh, sorry. Um, and and I guess the, the facilities manager piece is really important to me, but I want to make sure that we actually put together a comprehensive job description and make sure that our salary, you know, our, our salary um, matches like what we're looking for because I don't want to set this position up for failure because I think it is an integral part of how we move forward. Um, I also agree with the Emerald Ash Borer um, and the Art Synergy Plan. I'm assuming that's the $50,000 yeah. ask. Um, yeah, that's on my list too. So I don't think our lists are too far apart. Great. I also want to uh, echo what you were saying actually about the... Um, <laughs> They're done. <laughs> <laughs> we just figured it out. Right, right. <laughs> uh, before, sorry, before before we get too much further, and then I do want to hear other people. Um, uh, I I also have hesitations about the body cams for this fiscal year. Like I think that is a worthwhile goal, but let's do some more research. Sure. That's a whole bunch more research. That's where I'm at with the. And I think Tony's in the, the same opinion cams. at this point. Okay. You know, I, sorry. Other th other thoughts. <laughs> 
Yeah. So I, I guess this is a little late and like this is we're almost at 10 o'clock at night and the staff haven't done their work yet. So I don't want to say this is my absolute priority. Okay. Um, and I don't know that that's appropriate right now. That's fine. Um, but one of the things I did want to point out on that list that we kind of assume is this thousand dollars for the USS Montpelier for mm -hmm. their hotel rooms for the crew to come. And it's fine, but I'm also not sure that I would spend that on them rather than spending it on, say, the teen center or some of the other, you know, um, opiate addiction work or, you know, there's, there's, we have to make choices every time we decide to spend money here. And I don't know that that one's a priority for me. So <laughs> very good. There we go. Thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Other and, thoughts? and in all fairness, the, the VFW does support the I, I, Yeah, I actually cost. had a discussion with Bill about this already. All right, perfect. Uh, Donna. There is a committee very much involved in that group, so I think you would need to hear from the senior group of our community uh, that's involved with that. I, I'm really relieved that you're willing to put the body cams off. I think that's a huge discussion. That'll be put off for many, many years. Uh, <laughs> just, uh, it's terrible. Uh, for us to leap there, just, I mean, if Tony's there too, all the issues, the policy issues, uh, let alone the mindset, just drives, it's one thing I don't uh, support. Uh, but w within this, there are a couple things of which, like, we can talk about housing, and I assume that if we're going to put facility manager, just like housing, that we'll get numbers from the staff and they will tell us what they need and what the cost will be so mm -hmm. it'll be appropriate you know, for what you want to do. Uh, the housing has given us a number, the arts have. I really appreciate that. I don't know we really have a number for the police officer. I mean, I want that position, but I, I don't I think know that we, we have a number yet, so that would be good idea, to see. Yeah. Right. yeah, okay, well, I didn't see one up there. Maybe no, we, I missed yeah, it. Yeah, I don't. But whereas the housing. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I, I, and honestly, I purposely didn't um, assign specific numbers or costs to positions. I mean, I have some very, reasonably good rough ideas um, but at the same time I also don't want to be in a position where I scare everybody out of the room because I throw a number at every single position that's proposed before we've even made the decision so um, okay. I think well, if you're if the consensus is that you know police officer is important to the bulk of this council then that's something that we're going to firm up well, I don't know that everyone, I mean, I didn't see it doubled in your list, but I'm really interested. The one thing I'd add here is park staff. Mm -hmm. We have two people, uh, one who has so much comp time, he doesn't have to work for months on end if he doesn't want to. Um, and rightfully so, because they've been so overworked that we really need a third person in our parks. It's just, and they double dip with their job with the tree board. So in both of those sort of arenas, parks and trees, we need a third full-time staff. But I'd like to see some numbers on that if you're going to look at facility yeah. and police officer yeah. costs. And they are, they, that is up there, there as well. Staff, tree staff. The, sorry, right here, Donna. I, I want to see some costs, that's all. Yeah, I want yep. to, yeah come Absolutely. back with costs. Yep. Other thoughts? Yeah. I'd uh, like to just see overtime numbers by department. Okay. Um, I think that, that would help those. quite a bit. Um, just a thought as we're looking at the, I know it's good bang for our buck. Um, I can't support uh, VLCT. If we're spending $1 lobbying against minimum wage or paid family leave at the state house this year, using taxpayer dollars to do that. So I think maybe that's just a message to back to the board there that we'd like to see their position on that. Yes. Um, I would anyways, before I pr approve anything there. Um, and I think I'm with Ashley. Um, between Paco quitting after the last meeting and having another member of that board come up and say, would you put us out of our misery? I felt guilty when they came in here and did all this work, you know? They suffered over this work. Um, and I don't feel like they got clear direction on what to do next. So I'm inclined not to appropriate that money um, without giving them clear direction. If you want, you don't have yeah, to. I don't think I have much to add. I think I was captured pretty well uh, in your your list. I had two items, <laughs> and those are those are still my priorities. I think, and I I um, am uh, 
certainly very interested in all the other things on the list, but I don't know that I've made uh, a mayor uh, suggested prioritized <laughs> order well, of be all time. the other ones. So, yeah. Well, I can safely say I've hit 100% of the requests of at least yes. one council in this Yes, season, absolutely. Right? Yes. <laughs> so there I can go. With fully, fully satisfied. Thank you. <laughs> Anything you want to add? If, you, if not, that's fine. I, I think it uh, the list captures my uh, what I, I mentioned three priorities uh, housing trust fund which I would say is number one um, police officer and emerald ash borer um, it uh, I, I could may may wind up needing to recuse myself on the issue of the emerald ash borer and uh, and staffing for that um, I'll have to think about that a little more why would you recuse yourself for that? Because my son just got uh, I hired as the uh, arborist. That's that makes sense. Part-time okay. arborist, yeah. There we go. And and well, Depends get how your much he's further supporting thoughts you. another time. <laughs> Unless you want to add anything. Neither one of us is supporting. I guess know, I want to <laughs> see some numbers, and I want to see what the staff want, what yeah. the staff are willing to fight for before making a call. Yep. Okay. Well, I think what we we just want to make sure that there was nothing that was. You don't want that's on the list or where the high points are I think what you've helped I, I'll just say <coughs> and, I, and I it's no surprise that when we total up even the, the mayor's list with with the things that we we're going to be probably higher than what you had all indicated was your level of, of tolerance but at least it gives us a place to start and so while you know so I think you want to be thinking about at what level do you support these priorities if if we have to make Tough decisions time. because you know we're and and I guess that leads me to how what you want to see from us you know you, we talked about this a little bit uh, in terms of um, you know years past we've had a, a hard target this year you know we opted not to do that in lieu of this process and so I think we'd be happy to put together a, a detailed operating budget detailed numbers on these kind of things and just leave these open and then you can work down to where you want to get, or we can we can s do it in increments of this is what you know. But again, you know we're prioritizing our own too versus uh, our their own versus what the council wants. So you know, I, th I mean, I, I think the next step is just to see what the numbers are associated with all these things, and then I mean, I'm not sure that that's. <laughs> much different than what yeah. we had talked about. But. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'm starting to like lose it. No, I got it. <laughs> so, it's like, so uh, yeah, Donna, go ahead. Unlike, I mean, the staff positions are only other than going part time are hard to negotiate. But how much goes into housing? How much goes to the art? You know, we could start increasing those in a more smaller level than mm -hmm. requested, but at least have them present. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important mm -hmm. to see it. Great. One final item of business, um, CIP, we exchanged emails a little bit, is for at least for Anne, Glenn, and Donna. Monday, Fifth. still good for everybody? Yeah. And 5 or 5.30, do you have a preference? Nope. And I'm going to vote for 5. Sure. And I will send an invitation out in the morning. Great. Great. Thank you very much. I'll just make a request, and I don't mean to single you out, but there are people out watching these meetings who don't know what things like CIP, CIP. mean. So sure. I, I just want to yep. encourage all of us to remember to yes. say what we're talking about. Absolutely. Um, we, we take those things for granted sometimes, but CIP is uh, the Capital Improvement Plan, mm -hmm. and it is the committee uh, that will be meeting on Monday will be going through to look at the FY20 uh, initial proposals for um, infrastructure improvements to streets, paving, sidewalks, Building. and building repairs and maintenance. And so it's a fairly significant, sorry. And equipment, right? And equipment, yes. So, the big yeah. dollars. Yep. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to assume Thank no one you. has any other comments. Yeah. Just assuming we're having conversations with Bethany Church there about the warm shelter, um, and just the <laughs> pressures that puts on us. Um, I know there were a number of... Uh, calls that went out both from the police department and the fire department last year. So I think this is a really important service that they offer our community. I'm sure it saved lives. 
I just want to make sure we're doing what we can to support those guys. Okay. And Donna, sorry, <laughs> I may have just said December 5th. Monday. Monday, December 3rd, yeah, yeah. Monday the 3rd at 5 p.m. CIP Capital Improvement Plan meeting. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did I really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Amendments to the sprinkler ordinance. What do you think? Can, are, we, are we okay, team? Well, we've got to do two readings of it. So I yep. think we could go ahead and get one of those readings done tonight. I think you're right. <laughs> um, I can tee up. Wanna, if, yeah. 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 yeah, go ahead. Um, so as you know, we made a bunch of significant changes to the um, sprinkler ordinance uh, last winter, spring. Um, and uh, Glenn and I serve on the... Uh, building appeal committee that is basically known as the sprinkler variance committee uh, where we hear the requests for variance from the ordinance and um, it came to the attention of the committee that one of the weird things that happened as a result of our changes is that um, under effectively under the um, zoning and um, under, under the zoning ordinance uh, and the sprinkler ordinance, um, let's see how to put this. Um, we effectively treat a, uh, a duplex as a single family home under the, the new zoning. Um, and the state requires that you are allowed to add an auxiliary dwelling unit under a single family home. Um, so effectively, we treat triplexes as if they are single family homes um, in both the sprinkler ordinance and in the, the zoning. Um, and then once you get up to uh, four units or more, then you're really considered a multifamily building. Um, so the way that this ended up working was that um, there were exceptions um, and uh, to requirements for sprinklers if you had up to three units because we consider you a single family home. And there were exceptions uh, above well, four units, no, <laughs> about five units, um, if you met the state level requirements to have direct exits to the <coughs> exterior. Um, but there was, if you went from a, um, a three unit to a four unit, you would be required to have a sprinkler added and there wasn't really any way for us to, um, there wasn't a, an exception. Um, so the staff suggested um, a change, um, a wording change that would allow you to um, go through that and uh, that's what we're proposing. So I'm sorry that I've not articulated it very well. It is 10.05, <laughs> but I did well. in writing. So hopefully you read the memo <laughs> and I will um, attempt to articulate it better at the second uh, hearing. Oh, right. <laughs> and Bob, you're okay. Oh, yes. So we're going to officially open the public hearing on these uh, amendments. Uh, and Bob, you're, uh, yeah, how, so they, you're, they you're okay with these changes? Okay. They came from, came from us. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Chris actually came up with the wording change. Chris Lumber. Yeah. Great. And I know how concerned you all are about safety, so that mm -hmm. is very comforting. Uh, well, if we have to have it then I agree with the change. Fair enough. Yep, <laughs> yep, I, know. I, I hear I you. I don't on. agree with the initial change. But no, I, I, I remember. <laughs> Neither did we. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay, so um, comments from either the council or the public. Thank you for all the work you've done. Comments from the public. No. Going once, going twice. Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing on that. Uh, and we'll set the second hearing for the next meeting. Yes? While we're on this topic, just uh, flag another issue. I mean, I suppose we could amend this as a second reading, but I think that wouldn't be appropriate. But um, came up in light of the, the parking garage discussion, which was <laughs> that our ordinance requires all new buildings to be sprinklered, and this, the state ordinances for park for uh, sing freestanding open air concrete parking structures uh, require certain stand pipes but doesn't require the, the full uh, dry sprinkler system. And um, it's about $400,000 in 
the project cost, <laughs> which isn't we don't it isn't necessarily that much of a benefit to public safety. I mean, obviously, if it was a safe, true safety issue, we would be more concerned. Um, and whether it was us or any private person building a building of this type to spend money that isn't getting the value for, um, I don't think makes sense. So we propose that we, I mean, one choice is we go and seek a variance through the committee, but what's you know the real basis for that under our ordinance? And the second would be to simply amend the ordinance for structures like this. And so, like I said, we could do it as an amendment at second reading. I think that's not necessarily in keeping with the spirit of the process of having two meetings you know, where this hasn't been worn. So I'd recommend that if people are interested in taking that up, that at the next meeting, we do a first reading on that one. And, and Bob, how do you feel about such a proposal? Obviously, I like sprinklers in every building, but you know, the, there's some, you know, there's some common sense in an open air, freestanding parking garage. Great. Yeah. Okay. Rosie. I would suggest that the uh, ordinance variance process does really allow for the city to make the argument that they've taken X additional steps to protect public safety and therefore, I, I like how we've structured the um, variance <coughs> process to put the onus on the developer to prove that they've done other things um, that will protect public safety. So my inclination would be to just let it go through the process, although I'm there's three members of the committee and two of us are city councilors, and so that seems a little yeah, I mean, I think conflicted, and I don't know how we would deal with that properly. Um, but I think, you know, I, we talked about both options, and I think we felt it was more straightforward and honest to just say, here's, you know, this is the way it is. And, and you know, it's <clears throat> it's not out of the realm of possibility that someone in the future could build another one of these structures somewhere, a private person. And, again, why, I, like the chief, I strongly favor sprinklers um, and, and the investment in sprinklers for safety, but but you know the the cost versus the the benefit in these particular cases where they're not occupied you know i mean it seems you know personally that we've we've backed off on the residential sprinkler requirements and those kind of things that to insist on them in a parking garage seemed silly so um that's not flammable particularly right right and no people you know so I think it's just more straightforward to say, here's our intent, here's what we're going to do, and, and that anyone in the future would not have to go through the appeal process. But I think we should be upfront about it. Donna? Would you be uh, proposing the same language that's in the state rules? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. Okay. We, we, couldn't, we, can't, we can't be less restrictive than no. the state anyway, but I think we would probably just say parking structures would follow state, the state, state code, and, and, that's what, okay. and then refer to I'd it. I'd support and, that. We haven't actually That's drafted. A very good way to go, yeah. Okay. Do we make an amendment tonight? No, I no, wouldn't. No, we'd we'll wait okay. on that. I think we should propose it and put another. it on the agenda and let it be clear that's what we're doing. Okay. Is we would like, I would like an opportunity to add some different, some more wording to that yeah. also. In yeah, we haven't drafted anything. And okay. If, if it wasn't sprinkled, it would have protective <clears throat> stairwells, things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there uh, any other opinions about which direction to go? Alarms. <laughs> For example. Well, but if we made a change, it would also be posted, and maybe would that not get the same attention between now and then, versus waiting until? I, it's, you know, that's your call. I was just. It doesn't get posted until the w Friday that our agenda gets posted. Yeah, I get it. I, get, I guess I'm now. just subject. I'm conscious of some of the the comments and and things that we've received about the parking process, the parking structure process, and I think if, however well intended, if we were to, you know, we had an arg a thing warned about changing two and three unit buildings, and suddenly we amended it to s include the parking garage. I think it would be could be construed inappropriately as we were trying to slide something through. And I think we ought to just be straightforward and put it on the agenda. That's what we're talking about. And yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. it's more public notice to put it in, and then, then well, then we'll still have yeah, it public is more hearings. public notice, and I think it, that's good. We should have more public notice. <laughs> It'll, it'll be an ordinance change, so it would be two public hearings right. once we make the notice. Yeah. Yeah. 
So if we caught it in so time, we could have added it to this, but we didn't. So. Is, how, is that okay with yeah, you? Yeah, that sounds fine. Okay. Okay. Great, so we'll go ahead with that plan. Yes, Can Rosie? I make just one more observation? Um, as I was going back through the language of the um, sprinkler ordinance, I was realizing that one policy decision that we may we we made without really thinking about it, um, which is an okay policy decision potentially, um, but I just wanted to draw our attention to it, is that in our rush to um, or in our desire to allow for more units to be added to existing buildings without throwing up um, additional burdens. Um, we did basically allow, assuming you weren't expanding the building of the footprint by more than, I believe, 10% or 1,000 square feet. 50%. 15%, maybe. 50. There was, anyway, there yeah. was, a, <laughs> there was a, a small addition that you were allowed to make without having to add a a sprinkler. Um, for somebody who owned a multi-unit building, an existing apartment building, say of two units or, you know, or two, two bedroom units, um, there is nothing in the state law or our ordinance that would prohibit them from breaking that up into much smaller units without adding sprinklers. And right now we haven't really seen that as a problem happening, um, but I could foresee an instance where you know, you have a, a landlord who decides that they're going to make a quick buck by breaking these up into really tiny units. And in an old building without sprinklers, um, where we haven't been able to kind of come in and add some of these additional life safety requirements, you could have a bad situation um, where people are, you know, in, a, in un unsafe apartments, basically, that aren't protected. Um, so we kind of, we decided that it was more important to be able to add additional units um, but that is a decision we've made, and so I just want to make sure we all know that, and it's just kind of on our radar as something to think about if we do see, you know, there's suddenly a lot of landlords trying to squeeze more units in or something, um, that could be a, a problem, so. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, I've already closed the public hearing on this <laughs> ordinance, and we, uh, do we need to vote to set the we next? do. Okay, well. Is there a motion to set the second, second reading for the next, next meeting. meeting? So moved. Second. For the discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. What, can I have one more? Yeah. Okay. You, you made me wait to last, so I Yeah, I know, that. right. Yeah. And I just want to remind people of Monday nights. Um, we had a fire at 5 State Street on Monday night, right. and that building is standing today, and there's people living in it and working in it because of the sprinkler system. That was that building. We all know there's only one. You can you only see the front of that building. You can, you can't even get to the back of that building. It's surrounded by buildings, and this fire was in a fourth floor apartment in the back corner. It would have been extremely difficult to get to that fire. Extremely difficult and extremely dangerous to the firefighters if that fire had, if it had not been for the sprinkler system. We um, we calculated um, based on the amount of time the sprinkler ran and the size of the head, that probably 450 to 500 gallons of water flowed through the building. Caused a little bit of damage. But if that had not been sprinkled, we, that probably would not be here today, that building. And maybe some of the adjacent buildings. Could be adjacent buildings, yep. There were people sleeping in that building when the fire started. Um, and there so were birds below that you saved. The birds, <laughs> yeah, the birds went to made it. But it's the importance of sprinklers. You know, and you know that Can't that's a very valuable building that's still there today and occupied because only it wasn't because of me or the fellows next door. It was because of the sprinkler system. The fire we got there in under two minutes, and the fire was out when we got there. Hmm. Well, and if we need to be having any further conversation about like retrofitting uh, buildings, I mean that's. It's kind of a scary Well, I prospect. mean, that's, that's the policy decision we've made is that we wanted people to be able to add to existing buildings, add units. We wanted more housing units, yeah. and so we took away a lot of those mm -hmm. requirements to sprinkle in an existing building. Yeah. It was a policy decision we made, you know, but it's true. So anyway, I'm going to continue ongoing. to talk about it, including single-family homes, yep. including yep. single-family homes, because mm -hmm. as we talked about, 85% we had in... Um, Somerville, Indiana today, a family of six, mom and dad and four children lost their lives in their home. It burned and they lost their lives. That was this morning. Mm -hmm. It happens every day. And we, we need to continue to think about that. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, council reports. Uh, who would like to start? I will. Oh, whatever. Go ahead. Whatever. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley, you want to go next? Sure. Um, just jumping around. I would just like to remind everyone who is listening or watching or wh however you are participating in this meeting um, that there are resources uh, for addiction support and recovery here in our community and our surrounding communities that are critical, life saving things. Um, we've had a number of overdose deaths in the recent weeks uh, here in Montpelier and the Barrie area, uh, and I would encourage anyone who is uh, dealing with any sort of substance use or abuse issues to um, reach out to community supports. We have uh, a number of them available. Uh, law enforcement, actually, and uh, Montpelier Police Department here uh, offers um, rides to anyone who is willing to or ready to go to treatment. They will take you there, no questions asked. Um, there are also lots of service providers here in the Montpelier and Barrie area. Their door is always open. The Turning Point Center is a great resource, and I would just uh, encourage anyone watching this who knows anyone to, to sort of pass that on uh, because there have been an alarming number of deaths recently, uh, and it is entirely preventable. Thank you. Who else would like to go? I, I'll say something. Um, the other night, uh, over at the Barry Granite Museum, there was a great event uh, f for people to come over and see the uh, finished product of the series sculpture that's going up on the uh, State House. Um, there was a good turnout. The artists were there. I thought it was a great uh, celebration of, uh, of public art and the, the whole public process of the artist uh, uh, being they're doing the work and interacting with the public as, uh, as, as he was chipping away at the uh, mahogany was, was a great thing for the public. Um, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, uh, my wife and I had uh, Jerry Williams, who made the uh, clay model for this, do, uh, do a bronze of his previous uh, iteration of that uh, sculpture and so we brought that with us and so if you've seen any of my Facebook page <laughs> photos we'll see you'll see a picture of Jerry with the uh, clay model that he made which is about four feet tall and uh, and the the bronze that he was reunited with and I think that if people don't know about it Friday morning it's going up on top of the uh, of the dome I'm, I'm not gonna be able to be there but People should uh, try to make time to be there. You know what time? Friday. I, I keep hearing Friday morning. So it's Friday at noon. It's being hoisted. Friday at noon. And it's on, it's on display from 10:30. Fr I was gonna say it's like 10:30 that people can see it before it gets lifted. It's gonna dedicate it at 11:30 and then it goes up at noon. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to let you all know that I have decided not to run for re-election in March. Um, so I'm going to have my one term, and I uh, feel like I've put my all in for one term, but um, I can't continue to, to do it at this level, and I feel that even at this level, I'm just constantly in awe of Donna and your ability to go to every meeting and participate so much, and Glenn, your um, your ability to listen to constituents and interact with constituents. I just am constantly amazed by the level of work that my fellow counselors put in um, and feel like I can't continue to do that um, and still uh, give to the rest of the parts of my life. So um, I've learned so much from the staff and from the fellow counselors and I don't want to waste that so I um, I'm hoping to be able to serve on a committee or something going forward so that I don't uh, <laughs> don't disappear from um, Montpelier uh, civic life. But um, I wanted to give folks plenty of notice um, so that anyone who's thinking about running in District 1 uh, will have time to think it through. And I would be so happy to talk to anybody about what it's been like and uh, what the commitment is um, and to help you through that thought process and deciding if this is something that you can do. Um. I really, I really oh. miss you. Yeah, I'm. Wow. I 
I know. Uh, so just before we go any further, oh my gosh, Rosie, I am so grateful for all of your energy and time that you've been putting into being the best counselor that you can be because it, it really shows. And uh, whoever, you know, runs in your place uh, has big shoes. I mean, I think that goes without saying. Um, but we're just so grateful Thanks. for your great questions and great thinking and I and told Bill, I'm happy to continue sending annoying questions. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Please do. We You've got to be on the ordinance committee, woman. <laughs> You've got to be. <laughs> yeah. Oh, darn. I guess it's me. Um, I am strongly tempted to say that I've just decided to uh, talk Rosie out of quitting. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, You've got time. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. That sounded like a, a pretty well-considered decision, and I don't want to, to um, disrespect that. But uh, I would challenge anyone considering running to try to do it as well as you have. Mm -hmm. um, and I would totally open it up to the public, anyone who would like to try to persuade Rosie to. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm, I would encourage that. Um, and I will be at Baguito's tomorrow morning, 8.30 to 9.30, if you want to talk about that or anything else. Thank you. Donna, did you go? Um, yeah. uh, no, I haven't. OK. I've gotten comments from constituents concerned about streetlights, and at one point we talked yes. about a committee because there had been a committee that eliminated a lot of excess lights, but maybe we've gotten it too dark in some places. So I'd like to bring that back up. And also a, a couple emails about deer and deer yards, and there's a committee that Dee Dee, who was here, Marsh, uh, is leading, Marsh. dealing Marsh. about Montpelier deer. And then there's the commissioner of wildlife, a porter, who wants Montpelier to allow hunting for deer inside the city limits. So I think we need to become part of this conversation. So I'd like to put it out there as a future agenda item. Uh, so one thought about the street lighting. Um, if we want to get the committee back together, that's uh, certainly a possibility. I do know that we will be considering a... It's on the budget list to do the L L LEDs downtown. Which would make a big difference. Um, so, you know, we, well, we haven't got that many. Most of the complaints we've received have been about downtown, and there's a couple of State reasons. State Street, Outer State Street. Yeah. And we removed going. lights out there. Yeah, and sidewalks, people mm. who use sidewalks a lot. Yeah, and Barry. Well, yeah. they may, you know, but if it's just one light, maybe we can pop it back. So, I mean, they should contact mm -hmm. us if it's. it's so I had hesitated about getting the committee back together because there was this proposal that was um, on the table. Right. Um, so what we should talk about what's the well, best. I'll talk to staff, but it, yeah, let's. Yeah. I have constituents. I have more than one that would definitely like. Okay. Yeah, I mean, open to either. And, either and they've way, also mentioned crosswalks particularly are not lit well. And it's been on Front Porch Forum a number of times in the last few weeks. So it's been so dark. So dark. And the other thing, I'm just really excited about a potential of more green space <laughs> downtown. Thank you for considering it. <laughs> Great. Uh, so I just have one uh, thing to add, which is that some time ago, uh, as we were considering um, the charter change um, regarding sustainability, and we ended up narrowing it to um, uh, single-use plastics. Uh, part of that discussion was also around um, energy efficiency, and just want to update you that I'm continuing to have um, conversations and doing um, with our lawyer and doing some research as to uh, what might be necessary to have some um, level of energy efficiency ordinances uh, implemented. And so, just want to put that back on the radar that we may be having um, that discussion um, again in the near future. Um, so, hope to have more information to you all about that soon, uh, but not yet. So that's it for me. Tate Clark? Um, just real quick, uh, speaking of the charter changes. Um Oh, speaking of the charter changes, uh, the city clerk's office has started to uh, take an active role in uh, trying to make sure that the legislature hears the voices of the citizens of Montpelier uh, on the two charter changes uh, that we uh, we voted to enact on November 6th. Um, so I will be reaching out to all of you to ask for help. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of very quick things. One, uh, just to 
follow up on what Ashley said. Um, there was a rash of uh, break-ins in downtown over the last week or so. There was a lot of talk about that in businesses, in some homes. Um, and uh, while that person has not been uh, apprehended by us, um, they may have been apprehended by another agency for a different cause, but there's a strong suspect. And my main point is that it was directly tied into substance abuse and addiction and um, heavy issues. So um, we have our budget, what we call budget Congress next week. So that is, if you hear us referring to that, that's just the staff gets in a room for a couple of days and that's all we do for a couple of days until we come up with a number, so, or numbers. And one thing I just want to mention quickly, we've come up and we've, we've we're, we're talking about this, but you know, we had a, a somewhat of an extensive goals or a strategic planning process uh, this past year that I think most people liked and we talked some about doing it again next year and possibly also at least con including some members of other committees or at least tying it into the master planning process somehow. And I, I, you know, I know we're talking about something after the date of which at least one council member will not be a, a member, but, at, um, but there will be a majority of you returning, uh, assuming good health. And um, to the extent that we want to make some kind of commitment or try to start scheduling that, ideally with Julia again, um, I could do that. I just happened to have a conversation with her and she said she's booking up fast. So I thought I'd at least run it up the flagpole before we. Yes. I think I'd even sent you a note about yep, that. You do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. That sounds good. Yes. Okay. It's great. So that's all I have. Okay. Then without objection, we're going to consider this meeting adjourned.